How's everybody doing? So we shall get everything moving. So I guess the first thing we will do is um, start with the public comment. Does anybody have any comments tonight? Good evening, committee members. For the record, Fred Volz. Uh, regarding agenda item two, a review of the city's contract with Brown and Caldwell called for task 301, the costing of the 10-year capital improvement plans recommended in tasks 602 for the water system and task 603 for the wastewater. That section at the end of the status report in today's package has been left blank. So the question is, when will costing deliver the costing deliverable for recommended repairs be completed by the consultant. Another dimension of the same project is the completion status of the exempted water and wastewater items from the Brown and Caldwell contract, primarily items that were either subterranean or that could not be visually inspected. The question is when can we expect to see a completed study of any needed repairs and the estimated cost of those repairs? For agenda item three, the consultant summary report included in the agenda package does not split out power pole conditions by material type, that is wood versus metal, their respective pass fail rates, or the estimated cost of replacing marginal or failed poles. The question here is when can we expect this information will be presented to the committee for review and recommended action? Uh, I have another question. Is it accurate to presume that none of the suggested repairs from agenda items two and three are reflected in existing or requested fiscal year 2021 utility capital improvement projects? Well, 2.2% of additional budget was used between February 5th, 2020 and February 27th, 2020 for the utility capital improvement projects in agenda item number four. Three quarters of fiscal year 2020 has passed. It appears impossible to responsibly spend or encumber the other 66.1% of budget, just over $12 million, during the current fiscal year's remaining four months. Nevertheless, the February 26, 2020 edition of the city's capital improvement budget request continues to seek an additional $9.695 million of new utility capital improvement project funding for fiscal year 2021. We have over $20 million of carryover budget approvals and funds from prior years that have not been spent. There has been no change to the spreadsheet included with this meeting packet to explain how much in total has been and will be spent on a project by project basis, plus the cumulative carryover for canceled or completed projects that came in under budget in prior years. The city's finance department is either unwilling or incapable of generating such basic documentation for managing projects and money despite the magnitude of ratepayer money at issue. The question then becomes how can this advisory committee make fact-based judgments on which projects should proceed and which should be cut back or eliminated altogether without better accountability in one concise spreadsheet of all pending projects plus the carry forward of unspent money in prior fiscal years. The current situation brings into question whether any of the fiscal year 2021 utility capital improvement projects should be recommended to city council for funding by this committee until past spending and carryover surpluses have been better identified. For agenda item six, prudence suggests acknowledgement that unbridled growth continues in the Las Vegas Valley. We live in a desert with one primary water source and the, the committee could place Boulder City in the vanguard of water conservation policies by addressing city government, businesses, and residents. The obvious conservation steps are to eliminate ornamental turf at the golf courses and change water schedules to morning hours before 10 a.m. and non-windy days, eliminate ornamental grass in private yards, and take a hard look at whether all of the grass areas and city parks are truly necessary for public enjoyment and use. I'd ask that my comments be included verbatim in the record. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Okay, on the first agenda item is related to the minutes. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, first off, is there any more comments? No. <laughs> Public comments, I apologize. Not a good question. Thank you, we'll shut the 
comment period down and start with the first agenda item. And um, Chairman Carr, if, if, if I may, uh, staff would like to um, move the approval of the February 5 minutes to the next uh, meeting in March. I'm sorry, April. <laughs> um, just so we can put a little more time and effort into them to make sure they're accurate. Okay, I appreciate that. And to alleviate our frustration as well as Eileen's. Yeah, so I guess we'll see if we have time for three minutes in that. No, I guess it'd just be two minutes. It'd be this. It would be three. It'd be this. It'll be the workshop. It'll well. be workshop yep. and yep. this one. But we'll see how. If hopefully it goes better. We won't have too much of an issue. But hopefully. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So anybody else have any comments on the minutes? Okay. So let's see. We have both um, presentations. So I guess we'll just go down the line. So if we can hear from Brown and Caldwell. On uh, agenda two, did you have anything? For if students? I may, just real quick, I'll introduce uh, John Osborne, and I already forgot your name. Sorry, Esther Franco. Esther Franco. Um, they're from Brown and Caldwell. They've been John is the project manager. They've been involved in um, the work related to the water and sewer condition assessment. Um, and to answer the gentleman's question, um, this is really just the, the the first brief overview of what they found. Um, there will be a follow up. Uh, uh, that does have cost um, laid out um, that we'll be working with them on. Uh, that will it will come back to the um, committee in in April. Okay, so April then. So we'll see how we can incorporate everything into the uh, budget. Yeah, for it's good. 2021 and or what we and I can tell you this from what I've seen, um, we'll probably just start with 22. Because uh, it's it's mostly maintenance, but we can we can talk about that yes, at, at, at a later time. But uh, to I guess the good news is we didn't find anything alarming or high risk or significant, but there is a lot of maintenance items, so they'll they'll go through it, and you can certainly ask them whatever questions you want. So okay, Mr. Osborne, so she should have your presentation. Okay, so um, as was the uh, there you go. oh clicker, sorry, right awesome. And, uh, the rubbed off arrow is the one you use. The rubbed off arrow. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, as Dennis mentioned, um, we did find a lot of maintenance items, but there wasn't any you know critical items that we really needed to address today. Um, but we definitely want to get those included in the program. Um, as you're very much aware, um, Boulder City is fairly unique in southern Nevada in that um, you do have a lot of older assets. Uh, you don't have a lot of growth-related uh, assets that are being renewed on a regular basis. And so we're, we're looking at some pretty aged um, facilities here so and, and we'll, we'll go through some of these so we used a, a mobile data collection uh, device so that it, we were able to collect this and, and download that right into the GIS system so that there wasn't a lot of hands-on um, elements that are that are part of that uh, we we took photographs of the assets that we were able to, to visualize and uh, we recorded those, and those are those are attached with each one of the asset numbers uh, throughout the city. So the main objectives <clears throat> are to um, identify the the assets that we have in the system. A lot of that was uh, through data collection, the GIS system as built. Uh, perform uh, a field inspection of those uh, items. Uh, identify and uh, assess what those um, assets are and then develop uh, the capital improvement program in order to uh, address any of the concerns that we found. So the, the first item here that we've got are the lift stations. So there are three lift stations that are used in the collection system here in Boulder City. And uh, we're gonna go through each one of those. So lift station number one, um, this is, uh, we, we found that the 
Uh, some of the odor control here at this, this site uh, needs to be updated through uh, a biofilter blower. And John, can you go back to the picture request? So, so I can show them which one lift station number one is. So lift station number one is at the end of Nevada Way, where it comes in the 95 there. So while, while we've got this picture up here, uh, so lift station number one, that's what lifts um, all of the wastewater on the lake side of, of the city up and over the hill um, to gravity down to the sewer treatment plant. Downhill from lift station number one is lift station number three. And that, so these all kind of daisy chain together, and that lifts flows up to lift station number one, and then lift station number four also lifts that up, and then so everything gets pushed over through lift station number one. So, as you're okay with us asking questions? Sure. I really appreciate you it. Bet. So I noticed, um, did you guys just, um, am I missing something or did you find some additional um, items that are added to the um, presentation? The presentation we got has, has a few less than what you have. Unless yeah, so, th so that this, is, this is a live document that we, we initially sent over last Thursday to staff. And since then, we've had some internal meetings, and, and we've augmented that. So okay. Yeah, I, I, I asked them to bring the latest and greatest because they were still adding right, that's, stuff. So that, we'll and that, that is that. available okay. uh, for the city to, to download, and they can distribute that afterwards. Okay. Just make sure I understand. Thank you. Sure. Yep. So uh, odor control has been a complaint at this lift station. Uh, we identified uh, the biofilter uh, needs to be upgraded there. It's so identified that the blower is, is likely undersized um, as it moves air through that um, biofilter. That is that is what really takes care of the odor control there, and that seems to be undersized. So we need to make some enhancements there. Security fencing is is not there. It is on the on the front here on the frontage road, but it did not encompass the entire lift station. It is open on the backside. Um, there is also a request for a grit chamber to be added here. Grit is all of the granular material that comes in through the wastewater stream, and those have wear and tear on equipment, pumps, valves, um, backflow valves, and, and so forth. And so if we were able to put in a grit chamber, that would be able to capture some of those things and make the durability of, of that lift station longer. Um, also, there was a discussion of upside. So when I say discussion, this was this was discussion with some of the issues that staff are having at, at some of these facilities, in addition to our own uh, observations that we had. Question on that: um, Are the existing pumps adequate to handle any projected future growth down in the valley? Yeah, there's there uh, the at, at this lift station. So lift station number three. Uh, has some long time long and we'll we'll discuss that here in a minute that one probably is Due for an upsize because of the the, the run times that we're getting there. Okay. Thank you Do we have, Is there an excess how much grits coming in though you would have a grit chamber at a lift station I don't quite follow why that would be necessary more, it, more, more than me, you it think seems from like domestic be, flows. But we'd want to focus on the piping system, maybe upstream. I mean, I, what kind of grit problems do we have? Serious grit problems here? Is it that old of a system over there? It, it, it's it's not the age of the system. It's it's what comes into the flow stream. Okay. Are you finding what like gravel or sand, or is it just things beyond that? Beyond that, pretty much that. Yep. That's interesting how it would get in there. So. That was an, uh, an item that came up in discussion with operations staff. Um, yeah. I don't think it's a necessarily a requirement. Yeah. I think it's just something we'd take a look at. I mean, I just, I see that. Because yeah, that is all. I see that station uh, getting on, a lot bigger. Well, and everything on that side is obviously all domestic. Right. So, uh, right. That's why I was questioning yeah. what type, that much grid is coming in and what quantities. I'm, yeah. So we don't know quantities at this time at all. No, no, we, we have yet. there. There are grit chambers. There is a grit chamber at, at the other lift station. So, um, 
It's just what's collected upstream from here. Okay. It is captured. But well, we can get side. into the weeds on that later. Sure. But I just yep. want some questions. Yeah, and, and that and that really comes into play as we start to prioritize some of these things. And, you know, grit chamber at lift station number one may slide down the list and and we we just have to evaluate that uh, of what the what the cost benefit is to, to having that added. And for those of you up on the dais, the, the odor control system is the picture on the left, bottom left. It's basically a biofilter. Um, so you suck the air out of the wet well from the lift station um, through that biofilter. And in theory, it's supposed to remove the odors. And, and in reality, it doesn't work. So that's this is the lift station where we get the most complaints on odor. The, the other two... Don't even, I don't believe they even have odor control, but we don't get any complaints. Uh, but we do add bioxide. I'm just curious, is that a carbon filter or is it? This one here is a biofilter, so that is uh, bark. So that's wood bark. And so they, they fill that pit up with, with uh, wood chips. Okay. And then they bring the air in and then um, through, the, through the blower, that's what, that's what blows. So if we don't have enough airflow, then you're obviously not going to to do much with your odor. It's gonna, right? Okay. It's not gonna pass through. Is it dry media. wood, or I mean, it's not wet wood? Is it just dry wood chips? Well, it's actually there are sprinklers there to keep it damp. Okay, because it, it absorbs more more odor. It does wet, it, okay. it is more effective? And and there's there's all kinds of different media, but even when they've had new media, new wood chips in there, it's been ineffective. Okay. And those wood chips are getting hard to find and economically are getting really high priced right now. So anyway, that's a, we need to look into those little issues. Yeah, well, is there a chance of another bio, so we say upgrade the bio filter? Well, there's other systems. There's other, there's other systems. There's several other systems, but, you know. At, Different at cost, media that you cost. can, you can talking, put in there. You're talking low cost, initially low cost, what it was predicted years ago. And now this has turned in cut to kind of a problem because of the bark availability and the type of bark and so forth and so on. A lot of people now are moving over to manufactured rock if they stay with this style of station. But the volume and the space area increases with that. So there's other, gotcha. there's a lot of other factors that go into this. So anyway, again, something we have to get into, but what's the consequences? Yeah, the discussion continued uh, with uh, an emergency power connection to be able to come down there, plug in a generator. Uh, if if there was a power outage, uh, right now there that's not available. And uh, and then we also talked a little bit about uh, corrosion abatement to to some of the structures there, and just just kind of refurbishing some of the corrosion that we're seeing there. So that's lift station number one. Down the hill, this is lift station number three. Um, we talked a little bit about the sizing capacity here. Run times um, are almost constant here at lift station number three. And so sizing capacity on this lift station would definitely need to be um, re-looked at. Uh, grit removal, also here the opportunity of, of changing from VFDs versus the soft starts. And that's just the operations of the pump. And uh, when, when and if the, the pumps are upgraded, uh, we could take a look at, at some of those things in order to um, make it run more efficiently and not be as hard on the system with, uh, with the on and off, the starting and stopping of the pumps. Is that, is that kind of the new accepted, or is it a variable frequency drive or is it something that you're, just variable speed motors that right. you're putting in there? Right, right. So you can turn those down right. uh, with, with your lower flows, uh, and that really comes into play with the, with the uh, sizing of the pumps because we do have some high head to pump on these pumps, and so some, sometimes the VFDs do not work. We, we just have to take a look at that when sizing the pumps. Okay. Is and that then, an easy? Is that an easy change out to those pumps? I mean, are they pretty compatible? I mean, you yeah, you can, you can you can resize those, and and you can it's with, it's without all a lot of fooling around and you know retrofitting type of thing, huh? So, yeah, there's there's uh, it's standard flange uh, oh, good. connections and, and stuff that in order to exchange the pumps sure. and and valvings. 
And then also there's no security fencing uh, around this. It's, it's, per, it's pretty off the beaten path, so there's not a whole lot of folks that go around there, but it, it is unsecured site. And uh, odor control, so there are some odor blocks that are put down here in the wet well, and there's also bioxide on this site that is injected in here. And we just have to, staff has to monitor that a little bit. If they put too much bioxide chemical into the flow, then they end up getting a mat on the, in the lift station number one. And so they, they can't, they can't fix the odors at lift station number one by just injecting more chemical in, at this site. So it's a balancing game. Lift station number four is actually located out in the street. This is a submersible lift station. This is uh, what they call a package plant. And uh, so all of the, the lift station, the wet well, the pumps, those are all out in the street. And then the controls, electrical equipment, those are set off to the side. Uh, so some of the I did, I, uh, things that were identified was to shade the equipment, um, security fencing, that could all be taken care of with, a, with an enclosure. And um, wet well replacement, there's a lot of erosion that happens in, the, in this wet well. And so uh, looking for replacing that wet well and the foot valves that are uh, down in, in that uh, wet well as well. And then an emergency power connection is not available at this site uh, at this point in time nor is there a force main bypass connection. So the benefit of having that is if you come down to this lift station and you need to bypass the lift station to make any repairs here, uh, if it's offline, and they bring a pump on a trailer down here and they're able to pump it out, they don't have a quick connection on that force main that's already buried, you know, it's, it's already operational. And so that would really be a great asset to be able to put that in there uh, if anything happened to the lift station and they had to make some repairs, uh, they would be able to connect to that force main and pump them up uphill to the lift station number three. So we took a look at um, seven reservoirs um, through the city. And I know it's it's kind of a, a big picture here, so we'll, we'll go and identify e each one of these. So this is the Black Mountain Raw Water East Basin. And in here, so the, the real big concern with reservoirs is what kind of equipment is submerged in that water. And so those, those items that are submerged in the water, those are the ones that are susceptible to corrosion. And that's what we found here is the inlet valve actuator. Uh, you can see it's you know got all of the stalactites and stalagmites all all growing on those. So the actuators need to be replaced on both the inlet and the outlet valve, and then the drain valve needs to be replaced entirely. The body on on the other valves they look in fairly good condition, and that they would probably be operable if the actuator uh, wasn't so corroded. So if we went, needed to go and close one of those valves for whatever reason, and we put a wrench on those, those would not operate. Now, do you have to drain the um, reservoir to replace those? So that's that's a, to replace the drain valve. That's that's on listed as part of the items of repairing repairs here. Is that on the, is that on the outside or the inside of the? the it's submerged right now. So you'd have to drain the. We'd have, to drain, right. we'd have to drain the reservoir in order to replace that. So the, the better thing to do, it's a little bit more costly to do, but is to put that drain valve in a valve vault outside of that reservoir on the downstream side, and, and then you don't have a submerged valve. But, and then that way you can operate that and you don't have the corrosion issue that you do with a submerged one. Were those stainless steel valves? And Actuators? You know what? I, I, don't, I don't have the cut sheets on those. Um, they are, well, they're coated. Okay. So I'm not sure if they were, you know, stainless steel 304, stainless steel 316, but typically they are. Um, 
this was this is raw water now, but it, it was potable before, but it's it's raw water. So we, we found the same thing in the West Basin is the inlet and outlet actuators. The body of the valve is actually look in really good condition, and then the drain valve, that, that gate valve needs to be replaced. Black Mountain Potable, there are no submerged valves in here. There is a flat valve on the inlet pipe, and that looks to be in, in good condition. And actually, we found everything uh, to be in, in pretty good shape here, and that would just require continued monitoring. Do we have any THM issues here, Dennis? No. So mixing's not a big deal with these tanks? Um, our challenge isn't necessarily here so much. Um, our challenge with is more of um, further south towards the solar out fields. Of, out in the system? Because there's it's such a long, you know, it's 14 right. miles down there, so right. um, there is uh, probably some improvements with mixing that could be done that would help with that. Um, because what we have to do now to manage it is a lot of flushing. So we, we look at those mm -hmm. options of if we add some sort of mixing versus how much flushing we, we do, if it makes sense to actually add that mixing. So has mixing been concer considered on these, on these potable water tanks or not? Um. <clears throat> mixing, we, we haven't identified um, any real issues with uh, other than I think we we discussed a little bit about if we brought on the Hemingway Reservoir again, we'd have to probably put baffles in there, but that reservoir is currently not in use. Okay. Well, I think we'll make it as a line item, something to look at. Yeah, at least, sure. At least don't forget about it. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> this here is the is the West Tank. This is a potable tank. This this sets up here on the hill, and. Um, we identify that there is moisture around the base of the tank, and so we're continuing to, you know, want, want to monitor that. Um, we've got uh, on the on the right photograph there. We've got some corrosion on the outlet pipe, and then uh, another element is the drain line outfall. So if we needed to drain this reservoir um, for whatever reason, in it in or, or the overflow, for that matter, actually goes to that all, that drain line. It terminates just upstream of the neighbor's garage, and so it's we really need to extend this drain line outfall down below any of the neighbor's structures, and uh, into the there's a flood channel down below there, or a or a dry wash that that needs to go to. So does that one. I think it used to have uh, active cathodic protection. Does it still have it on there, on that tank? Um, I believe there may be some anodes in there. Just anodes, but no active, uh, where they're actually impressing a current on there, huh? No. Really? Okay. Um, so most, most of these photographs on the inside, uh, obviously those are taken from the divers. Uh, really didn't see any corrosion issues with that, which is pretty remarkable when we look at the age of this facility so but we do have some corrosion on the piping I, I believe it was um, it was recoded about five years ago yeah this is uh, twin five um, twin five the west reservoir and um, here we found the inlet and outlet pipes. The, while there is corrosion around there, there's no structural uh, concerns with that. The real concern there is the drain gate. And you see that in the center photograph there. That is all rusted. And e even to operate that valve, you would have to send a diver in to open that valve up uh, in order to drain that. And I'm not sure that that would even, I'm not sure that gate would even work. So that's, we found that on, on both the east and west reservoirs there. Um, and then we will talk a little bit about the pump building decommissioning or repurposing. And again, we see a little bit of corrosion around the, the inlet and the outlet. And when these are just 
photographs of two of the inlet or outlet. There's, there's actually seven pipes that come up through the floor of the reservoir uh, for the inlet and seven on the, for the outlet uh, for recirculating flow. That was the reason it was designed that way. And then the drain gate here as well. We'd recommend bringing that out and putting that into a valve vault on the exterior of the reservoir uh, so that it could be operated and maintained without having to send a diver in to do that. Can those inlet and outlet structures, can they be replaced or re rehabbed or, I mean? Yeah, but there's really no structural concern with that right now. There, There's no valving on them. It's, it's just the... It the be, be cleaned up and recoded maybe. Yep, that's it. Yeah, so structurally they're they're in good shape. And there we go. And then there's also a, a pump building there on the site and the this pump station is no longer operable and so we could repurpose this pump building, remove um, the pumps, the piping, and there is some storage there and so the, and, uh, the electrical equipment and move that out and make it more of a useful facility. Right now there's um, just distribution gate valves that are, that are being stored there and, and that could be really repurposed and, and used uh, for more storage because this pump station is no longer operable. This is the Hemingway Reservoir. Um, this was starting to be refurbished here um, a while ago. And when they got down to the floor, they identified that uh, there's just holes in the floor. It's rusted. You can see that center photograph. Uh, if you can look a little closer, maybe on your, on your uh, line, you can see a pair of pliers down through the, the hole. It's, it's corroded all the way through. So... Um, a little bit of the challenge with the Hemingway Reservoir, this has been taken offline with some of the um, water conservation that is, has been implemented throughout the city. The demand for this reservoir really kind of went away and there, were, there wasn't a, a need for it. And there currently is no need for this. And so to put it back online would cost quite a bit of money. We'd have to install a new floor in, in this reservoir to make it operable again. And then we would likely put baffles in here to recirculate the water just to make sure that we get a, a good turnover in it. But right now there's no demand that would require that. For the committee, we modeled um, the entire system um, last year, um, both the Potal and Raw side. We modeled it with and without the reservoir. And this is, as far as the storage requirements, uh, it's not necessary to put it back in service. Um, and if we did, it would probably exacerbate some of the TTHM issues. So right now we're not planning on putting that back in service. So on the water distribution side, um, there's not a, a lot of items that are available for us to look at on the surface, but uh, there are some meters. So we went and we, we reviewed all of the, the water meters that are throughout the city, identified some that have uh, some moisture, and so we, we may put some drains in those and, and maybe some vents just to keep those dried out a little bit. But um, there, there really wasn't any issues that we came across on the meters. Are those meters just, are they just uh, metering the flows like into the golf courses and the large yep. users? Okay. Yep. That's the only reason they're there, just for those big, large users. Okay. Correct. And, the, and our understanding is that these are read on a monthly basis. Oh, okay. The only um, thing I'll throw out there for the committee to consider is uh, while we have AMR um, on the electric side with the electric meters, we've only, our uh, we only have about a thousand of the 6,000 meters um, that are AMR on the water side and frankly it's just been as a meter is replaced we put in a meter in it with the automatic meter read so something we may want to consider is just getting that done over a year or two period um, because at the rate we're doing it now it'll probably take 20 years and then we'll be into new technology by then anyway so um, 
but right now there isn't a capital item in 21, 22, 23, or 24 to re to install AMR on all the meters. Do those AMRs, do they use batteries in those? Yes. Okay. Yeah, those are, uh, uh, they are our ITRON 100Ws. I don't, Mike, do you know the battery life? So you just replace the meter in 20 years and start over again. Yeah, and a 20-year replacement on a three-quarter inch, five-eighths a meter is pretty normal. normal. Yeah. In fact, you can usually get more life than that out of them. So. so we've got, uh, we also looked at uh, the ARVs through the GIS and uh, identified that a lot of them are actually just manual blow-offs. And so when, when filling up a water line uh, or anything like that, then staff would go and open up these uh, blow-offs in order to release the air and, as they're filling up the water line. So a lot of these are not actual ARVs. Um, there's some po photographs of some pictures of some ARVs there on the, on the right-hand side. And those are typically in kind of a white can that, that sets up on the surface. So most of these in the GIS are identified um, as ARVs, but they're, they're really blow off. So we're updating the GIS to identify what's actually out in the field. This is a good example of where we found the jet, some misinformation within the GIS system. Um, so we're going to have to clean that up, the difference between the ARVs and the, and the blow offs. So that, that's the nice thing with the, with the mobile device that we're, we're capturing this. It captures not only the photograph, but the location of where we took the photograph, and that is all dumped down into the GIS, so that's, that's available. And then um, butterfly uh, valve replacement. So throughout the city, there's a lot of butterfly valves. Those are typically not used in buried service. Uh, those are usually uh, a gate valve system, and so there's a lot of butterfly valves that it really take. If if there is a repair that needs to be made, um, it takes multiple lines, multiple valves in order to find a valve that they can actually close down. And so every valve that does not work, it cuts off that many more uh, citizens from water in order to make that repair. So. Um, as those lines are taken off, they replace as many of those valves as they possibly can uh, during that shutdown. So that's just part of the, the program, and we, but we wanted to identify that. The only thing I can surmise here is we must have got a screaming deal on butterfly valves because typically you just would not bury um, those bury those or put them, put them in a distribution system. So... Um, it does make sense to go in and replace them over time. So I'm sorry, are you replacing with butterfly valves or are you replacing? No, with the, no, we're replacing with, with the resiliency okay, the gate valve. Sure yeah. Okay. yeah. So the gate valve on, on the left hand side, that is typically what is used in a water distribution system. Are they pretty reliable? I mean they, they last a long time. They do. And they're that's and that's and uh, they found that they put butterfly valves even on the fire hydrant turnout, so it's it's throughout the the distribution system. So they're they're replacing them uh, as much as they can uh, when they do have a break, so that they can help isolate and cut down on the number of people that are offline when they have a repair. And you can and you can imagine just by looking at the valve itself. I mean, the butterfly itself is in the flow stream. Oh yeah, it just and like so it's, it's yeah, it's you know. And so the gate is, is fairly easy to take, disassemble it, and, and lubricate it up, and put it back together. Huh? Yeah. The, well, those are typically buried, and yeah, so yeah. can they can they just pull the top off of it and just basically pull it out? They can. You can re you can repair those, but um, the main thing is is that I mean, there's a lot of valve there, and so it can take a lot of corrosion. Uh, the butterfly valve is in the in the flow stream, and the the gate valve, the actual closing device. It comes clear up out of the flow stream, and so mm -hmm. you, you don't have the pressure drops across it either. Uh, 
I can't remember the last time I saw a butterfly valve in a portable distribution system until I came here. So, city also has a, a water lateral replacement program that is ongoing um, as as they're coming across those repairs. So we wanted to include that. As Dennis mentioned earlier, this is really a, a maintenance program. So we're including both the butterfly valves and the water lateral replacement. We want to identify so many per year in order to get those um, included in this program. So what are failing? Are they the PE, the polyethylene? Are they the PVC line? Or just I know there used to be copper years and years ago that they used, and then they got away from them, and, and now they're going back to the copper. I see. I believe Mike, it's mostly the PE and some copper. Yeah. Yeah. Do and you this, have any PVC? Uh, almost no PVC. Okay. And this, there was a, there was, a, there was a time uh, where all the entities were putting in the PE, and and now all the entities are have replaced significant. Um, and when I say the entities in the valley, all have service line replacement programs because they've been problematic. So the cop. I know I always like copper, but is, is it really pretty hard? I mean, it's pretty hardy. I mean, it lasts a really long time. Yes. It does have a lot of erosion with it. Yeah, you just, you know, the, the details we use, and our standard details contains all the, the appropriate corrosion control between the copper and the and the meter and all that stuff, so. So that's a long time fix then, huh? If, it, and as long as it's installed correctly, yes. And that, that was part of the problem in, with some of the PE product as well. It was both the product itself as well as some of the installation was poor. I, I mean, at least in my his experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then we get to the sewer collection. So this is on the gravity sewer. Um, these manholes here, these are downstream of the discharge from lift station number one. These are around uh, the Albertsons and um, also um, down Buchanan. Buchanan. And so those are all downstream from, from the discharge point of lift station number one. So there's a lot of um, H2S and that hydrogen sulfide gas that mixes with the water and that creates your sulfuric acid and that eats concrete. It loves concrete. And so that's what you're seeing here is the deterioration of the concrete here. So I, I know it's it's caused because when you go up over the hill, you basically the pipes full, and then you go over the hill, and it it, it it fills the pipe only halfway up, and so you got air all the way around it. But is there any? Can those be aligned with like an epoxy coating, the concrete linings? Yeah, there's there's lots of rehabilitation methods. Um, there's polymer concrete inserts. Um, they're manufactured right here in Boulder City. There's um, CIPM, which is kind of, um, it's a fiberglass insert that can be blown up and it can be cured in place. There's also um, epoxy coatings. There, there's all kinds of different coatings and inserts that can be put in here to rehabilitate. So, so there are fixes and are they reasonable or are they going to all be any, really expensive? Yeah, there are, there are fixes. The alternative is is that you have a collapse out in a road, and that's and that's not acceptable. Obviously, right. structurally, these are these are still okay, and these can be rehabilitated. So I'm not saying that any of these structures need to be replaced, but they certainly need to be addressed. And you and you can see some of the steps. I mean, you just simply wouldn't use those steps. There's no way you'd step on one of those. And then down here at the wastewater treatment plant. Just uh, one question, I guess, since we're going yep. out of the water aspects. Um, so I guess there still was a little confusion on the main pipes. You, you said you don't really have a good way to test it, but the main water, the main water lines um, taking it, I guess, probably including what we're talking about, the butterflies are in and all that. Um, is that, did you at least take a look through with the GIS or how was that? somewhat evaluated. I thought there was going to be some evaluation because you said under, below ground you were doing very minimal work. Yeah, there's, I, I mean, there are technologies that are out there in order to, to take a look at it. Really, the, the best indicator is really when I get with Mike and we find out how many 
repairs are being done in a certain area, and, and then those are those really help identify where where the issues are. But um, you know, there are technologies where you can run uh, you can run an, an instrument ball down through the the flow stream, and you can you can pick up different things. Um, from a from a sonic indicator, you can identify some some issues there. There are some some other things where you'd have to ex expose the pipeline um, on on the metal pipe, and then there's a little donut that goes over that, and it can it can identify the wall thickness that are on the pipe. So there are technologies out there. We we just haven't gotten to that point. And and for the for the committee, you know, the majority of our pipelines are small diameter, so the risk is. A little different you know and our break record is really good we don't have a history of significant amount of breaks so what are failing are they are they the transite lines or the pvc's not failing and much? nothing is really failing so the ac lines themselves and are really pretty um you know the guys don't like working on them when they have to uh, because they are ac but unless you do work around them um typically it's pretty solid as far as the, the so so that that's basically what condition. I'm getting at. It's probably what's my impression is that they're all in pretty good shape because mm -hmm. of the, you're not seeing many breaks. And no. So it looks like the valves are the big issue here on these things. So, so. typically what you will see on small distribution uh, programs is more of the paper study where you you use the GIS to start um, trending the breaks in the areas where the breaks are occurring and then you develop the programs around that, which is what we can do um, with the GIS system and with the proper, I'll, I'll do my commercial real fast here, with the proper uh, CMMS system, which we don't have in Boulder City and desperately need, so that's a it's commercial. Um, then we, over time, you would develop that program and put together and to find areas which um, you would replace but at this point in time we don't see anything on the small diameter which is good news um, and, be, and because your system really is a a gravity fed system from your reservoirs you don't have a lot of the cyclic pressures that you would with uh, with pump stations and so you don't get the surging uh, in your system and so I'm, I'm not surprised that you're not seeing a lot of uh, a lot of the breaks. The, probably the biggest concern is pressures. So it, we do have a line that goes down close to the close to the lake with super high pressures on it, and you know we, we need to make some recommendations on uh, adding some PRVs or or maybe um, taking a look at some operational changes there so we can get those high pressures. Both. Hit, yeah, both, yeah, both, both. Actually, high pressures in both directions. And yeah. we, we are actually contemplating getting with the Park Service because we serve the Park Service, and that line is 400 PSI. And, and yeah, we just need to go back and look at that contract and see what their needs really are. I think they're just using it for some irrigation somewhere. I'm not even sure. So, was it designed, was it designed for that, for those kind of pressures? I think it was designed for that because it used to pump up. Um, if my memory serves me yeah, right, so it was. Yeah, so it was. It, you know, it's that old goes right through that old pump station okay. off of the freeway there. So the two way station, there and you there. can you know you can hear it screaming through the pipe there. So um, if it breaks, it's going to go. That's for sure. We're going to know it. Um, we'll be able to find it. Um, but um, again, it's it's. I think it's worth taking a look at the need that the National Park Service has and, and whether there's some potential for even taking it out of service, possibly, versus spending a bunch of money on PRVs, which was what we would have to do. Okay. Um, and, and so here's out at the, at the treatment plant. The treatment plant actually operates very, very well. And uh, we do have just uh, some some minor things that uh, we wanted to wanted to look at. So right now, uh, the trash rack at, at the headworks we need to update the the auger system that is there. It's really not collecting uh, a whole lot there, and that is currently in a in a study being taken care of and taking a look at what we might be able to do in order to make some modifications there, so that we're we're collecting a lot more of 
the grit and the other things that, that show up in the flow stream so that those don't get collected down in the lagoon system. As a reminder, this was at, in the capital improvement plan as replacing the entire headworks. Um, we believe we can do some modifications of the uh, headworks without having to do a total replacement. And so we have somebody looking at that as we speak. So. Is there still a commutator there that drives the, the stuff up that goes in? Yes. So, and so that's different than this thing here. Then. Yep. Yeah, and, and there's a portion of the flow that bypasses the, the okay. grinder unit, so that's problematic as well. So I think all it's really going to take is the replacement of the screen uh, underneath the conveyor, um, a narrowing of the channel, and some other things. And I mean, it may still be $100,000, but I don't think we need to go in there and replace everything. Yeah, that's, that's um, good. Because they were talking about just building a new headworks, and that headworks here was built in 2009, not, I think. Yeah, it's the not structure that old. itself is not that old. So. Well, that, that's that's good news then, if you don't yeah. have to replace that thing. Actually, just to say, so there's 400, I don't know if this is the wrong place to ask this, but in your budget there, it says $400,000 or something? Yes, and so that was to replace. Oh, so this is so what we're saying. We we haven't changed it in that because we want the engineer to look at it, but we're we're expecting it to not be four hundred thousand dollars. So this is the uh, bioreactor or the aeration lagoons, and some of the repairs that we identified there. Um, the shot Crete embankment they're they're being undercut. So um, the structure of of the lagoons there's a there's a plastic liner that, that goes down in there. There's also a clay liner that goes over the top of that and then up on the, to protect the, the edge of the, the lagoons, there's some shotcrete and that's being undercut uh, with some of the wave action and things um, out there. So that needs to be repaired and ultimately like to go back in there and do a concrete liner. Um, that would just really change the, the way that the lagoons are operated. Right now, they just have to pump the solids out of there uh, when they when they dry those out and, and and pump that out in order to dry it and then and then remove the the sludge from there. So right now, there you really can't drive any equipment in there in order to in order to pull that out. And so it's a pretty labor intensive operation. Where if we had concrete lined aeration basins, they could they could run in there with a skid loader, pick it up, and it would be done. So. That would be a great improvement down there. And then um, there's, there's a manhole uh, where we could put another, uh, some gates in there to direct some of the flows a little bit better. But um, outside of that, really the, the aeration, uh, the lagoons themselves actually operate very well. So what kind of a liner? Is it like a shot creek or would you have to go in and form and pour and like six inches thick or what kind of a liner are you talking yeah, about? So, so ultimately the, the concrete liner, it would have to be a drivable surface. So you'd, you'd put, yeah. Pretty prop, thick then. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to basically form and pour something like that. Yep. Okay. And you could look at some options. You might be able to do a roller compacted concrete. So you wouldn't, you would potentially that would be an option that might be a little cheaper but we'd have to look at those options yeah we, we have done we have done some lagoons where um, you do have the plastic liner on the side and then you've got um, a hydro asphalt down on the bottom that's a drivable surface so uh, there's there's a lot of different options we can look at in order to be able to bring equipment down into there and this is honestly the my been involved with quite a few lagoons, and Howard probably has too, but I've never seen one where they put the liner and then put the clay on top. So that was a little different, but. And I've yeah. never seen a lagoon with all aerators running at one time either. So. Uh, here's the chlorine contact channel and the, and the outfall. So there's just some corrosion here. Um, and it would be really nice to be able to have a redundant chlorine contact channel so that we could take one offline, uh, make any repairs that we, we needed to do down there, and uh, keep keep the outfall uh, fully operational. So it, d it wouldn't take a, a lot of real estate in order to do that, and it would just really improve the operations there. So 
Um, that was that was one of the recommendations. And have they then, ever been able to make? Because it's been there a long time. Have they ever been able to get in and clean it out and maintain it? Or has it always had to be in operation? It's always been in operation. It's it's always been in operation. And part of the problem with it right now is the way they designed the chlor the bleach to be diffused into the basin is. It's not a mixing device like you would anticipate. It's just sprayed, sprayed in. into it, so the the uh, there's corrosion around the uh, the inside perimeter of the wall, and so there's some improvements that have to be done with that as well. Uh, we, they did try coating. Uh, you know how salesmen are. We'll we'll do it for free, so we can show you that it worked, and so they did it for free, and it didn't work. So. Um, uh, so we know not to use that um, material, but um, again, uh, 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 it would be good to have that second um, contact basin. And then there's uh, just just continued maintenance of the outfall channels. Those uh, have have changed since uh, I-11 went through there, and so there's there's some some piping changes that have to be monitored, and there's staff that goes out each day to to make sure that the those sandy channels haven't blown out and they they have to run a grader down through there so so we have an we have a easement that we have to keep the flow within the channel um and as the you can imagine what's happening out there there's it's got water so it's growing lots of vegetation and so the the channel's less divide less defined and it's starting to widen a little bit and get close to those getting closer, it's not there yet, to those boundaries of the easement. So it's just a, really, it's a maintenance So issue. how does it get under the freeway? Is it an enclosed pipe or is it a channel? It goes under the it, freeway. It's piped. It's, yeah, it's yeah, piped. Right. How big are the pipes? I don't remember the outfall on that. Do you, Mike? It's like a 10 or 12 Well, that's all, huh? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Something that hopefully not going to have to be replaced someday, huh? I believe it's in a casing. Okay. So I think when they put I-11 in, they put in a casing. And then this is just kind of an overall map of what we would identify improvements for each one of the areas and uh, map those out through throughout the a 10 year program. So this is just kind of a, an, an idea of what, what the overall plan will be. And we should have those numbers applied by April. So this is where um, we'll have to sit down. We as staff will have to sit down with Brown and Caldwell and figure out how to package it. Because uh, as you can see, a lot of it really, there's a large amount of it that is maintenance driven. Um, but if we're gonna talk about uh, a butterfly valve replacement program, then that may be something we wanna package up into a CIP project. and do a certain amount every year or something like that because um, the reality is you know Mike's group can get to some of this but there's no way they're going to be able to get to all of it in a certainly even a five or ten year plan probably with the staff they have so we're just going to have to look and see what portion would be CIP driven what portion we would put in their operating budget. Yeah, I had a question. Is this going to be wrapped into this five-year CIP that we're supposed to evaluate, or this is so? Going to... So, what I would uh, suggest is that we don't worry about it as it relates to FY21. Um, and as we work with the consultant, we certainly make sure we get it built in, or at least the part that needs to be built into the, because what the plan is to make it a ten-year, uh, so that the rate model itself can have everything included. But, you know, we can, our guys can do some of the work. We can start on some of the manhole rehab, uh, you know, internally. Um, and those those areas that we have more concern about, we can take care of. But um, I prefer that we not worry it as it relates to FY21, but certainly start hitting these items from 22 through the next 10 years. So we have the current, um, we've got to figure out what we need for. So somewhat on this line, so I'll just try to go quick, quickly because it's probably more of another agenda item. But I guess the bottom line is we're just going to have, I think this group will be continuously looking at the CIP projects just to, so we can try to figure out how the things are changing. Because a big issue is bringing, bringing things from the past 
forward, which we'll talk here in a little bit too. But this still is an ongoing with the water thing too, is, is what, what we need to, to work with. Yep. So, we'll, so basically we'll be looking at a draft report next, I believe, is that correct? And, and so you and the, the city and the... And, and we'll have to sit down and try to figure out what, that's, what that actually looks like. Yep. So at least to give you something to um, digest. And then, so what type of time frame are we looking at for a final report? So we're trying to get the CIP and mapped out so that it can go hand in hand with, uh, with the rate study. And then all of the assessment and, and other backup stuff will follow after that because we, we've got the schedule we're trying to, to kind of bring bring the, the rate study together with that. So that will come up in April as a, as a draft and then we'll, you know, I'm not sure what the, what the final is in particular with uh, feedback and input from the city. And then the full assessment report, I'm guessing we're, get, we're gonna see probably June, July time. The, the hope being that the, the draft has the information we need to, to um, populate the rate study, right. CIP. Okay, anybody have any other questions? Do you have anything else, Dennis, on this? Nope. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time, and um, thanks for, for the input. Thank you. Okay, so we will then um, go on to the, let's see, what are we exactly calling this? The update on the, no, see, the power, power pool, cons, um, yes, the drone report is, I guess, the good way to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have anything, Dennis, to start with on that? So uh, just a little bit of background. Um, when we, when staff dove into this, we started to look at the options for doing the the the, the poll assessment and some and and um, uh, the old fashioned. I don't know if I want to call it old fashioned because it's actually still done that way is that you send a, you you do um, some integrity testing on the poles you climb the poles you do visually um, but what we identified was that with the drone technology we can do the same thing because the technology's gotten so good you can do the same thing uh, and get a lot more poles done for the amount of money we had uh, it's also easier from a traffic control perspective, as you can imagine, if you have to have a, a, a you know, a, uh, a cherry picker out there or a, a bucket truck out there, then you've got to have traffic control at every pole you go to. You have to get it in alleys. Um, that being said, we did have some citizens that were concerned about it, drones flying around their backyards. But I think in general, when we explained to them, if it wasn't a drone, it'd be a, a guy in a bucket truck staring into your backyard. You know, it, it, it seemed to resolve that. I think they could maybe communicate that a little better than they did. What we did, though, uh, to make sure we were satisfied with the results that we were getting is we just did a test um, run down Adams. Uh, of those 69 KV lines and some of the uh, and, and the poles, um, without telling them that we were going to replace them anyway, um, because we wanted to see what their results were versus what we thought we needed to do, because we knew we were going to be replacing them, and they basically validated exactly that. Um, so they'll go through and identify what uh, they found. In this case, it's going to be staff that's going to develop uh, the costs because it's something. Marvis does on a regular basis, and then we'll we'll develop a program for the committee to consider. You know, obviously um, there were quite a number that failed, and but it wasn't frankly it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, so that's a good thing, I think. Um, we'll just have to look at what makes sense from a program of doing X number of polls per year and costing that out and putting it from the in front of the committee to to discuss. And we should be able to do that in April. I've been obsessed with the CIP right now. So how does this factor into the CIP, this information? It, it doesn't. Yet. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. No, because we don't have those costs yet. So, and again, um, we'll 
frankly, we'll we'll have started that program when we do the 69 kV uh, project. Uh, it, it in and of itself is going to replace all those poles from BC Tap to uh, to Buchanan. So, you know that. So, what I would I would again say is I think we would not worry about it as it relates to FY21. We would build it into 22 going forward, unless there's just something that has to be done. But um, obviously we found a number that failed in the in integrity testing and there, you know, right now what we do is when either we know we need to um, replace it and that's what Marvis's group does now or potentially it falls down, but I don't think one more year it is, again, because we'll be starting with some of the projects we're doing anyway. Um, but they'll go through a lot of it, and I think you can I ask them questions as need be. Was this part of maintenance or part of um, an older uh, SIP? So the cost of, for this part, I just out of curiosity. There was no um, pole replacement program. Maybe there was way back when, but there hasn't been, so this would be new. No, but the drone the drone cost. Oh, the drone cost. out of curiosity. I'm sorry, as far as? This the cost of ha for the... For the project, oh, for the project, it yeah. was uh, just under 150. Um, and if we would have done that manually, I yeah. So I, I think it made a lot of sense to do it that way. But it's just part of a professional, because yeah, professional budget, service and contract. Service. Yeah. Okay, just trying to keep an idea. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly what it was. So okay, how many you. did you did you do all the old distribution poles? Um, what I had Marvis do was uh, identify the older areas and and kind of four kV stuff. Yeah, sure. and then we. Oh, really? Okay. So really? pretty much everything That's would... That's expensive then, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Luke is here from um, Mile High Drones, and I already forgot your name. <laughs> and so they'll be providing the presentation today. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for, for having us. Um, so, yeah, we did inspect uh, 793 poles, um, and uh, Dennis has asked us to go through each one of those in detail. So, tonight. So. Sure. Yeah, in, in detail tonight, so um, might be a might be a long ride. Um, so we did have some slides um, there. There we go. <laughs> now, so we'll we'll start just uh, explain a little bit about who we are, as well as kind of the technology that we used, um, and then uh, go through kind of the how to understand our findings, and then go through kind of a summary of the results. Uh, that we had, we will have the full report uh, available to Dennis, so uh, there, there'll be all the details in that, but we won't, we won't bore you guys with that tonight. Uh, so as far as uh, who we are, um, combined we have about 35 years of experience in uh, utility inspection industries, and the, uh, the software uh, that we use as far as inspecting, uh, we've analyzed over 100,000 power poles across the U.S., so uh, it is using uh, a, a new technology that Luke will get into a little bit of combining both ground and aerial. Uh, and so uh, we found that it's got uh, really good results at an affordable cost uh, to get done what was uh, used to take a lot longer. Yeah, thanks everybody. Appreciate you having us here. Uh, as Dennis had mentioned, it was a, it was a fun, fun uh, time that we got to spend here. Obviously, whenever there's, we're, we're appreciative that you gave us the opportunity to come and kind of talk about what we did, especially when it relates to UAVs, drones. You know, we, we had a lot of uh, attention in the neighborhoods <laughs> and um, it was good. It was a good, it was a positive experience in just getting to speak about new technology and speaking with, I guess, the citizens as to what we care about, which is, <clears throat> safety, efficiency, um, and good data collection. So with that being said, um, the way that we inspect power poles, uh, it's, it's not a traditional way, but it is, it is normalizing. And, and what, what people are doing now is an aerial inspection using um, a UAV to capture data in order to get a full look of, of what people may have not always been seeing in the traditional methods. And what I mean by that is we'll go above the pole, We'll go below the pole, we'll go below the ground actually, um, I should say, 
and we, we do a full 360 of the pole. We'll take typically between 8 and 12 shots per pole um, at 45 degree angles down, 45 degree angles up, and at 45 degree angles on the pole. And then on the ground inspections, um, in the least intrusive manner possible, we collect the data of the integrity at the base of the pole underneath the ground. So, How, how deep did you go down? Typically about 12 inches below the ground. You'd actually put a, put a rod or something down there or you dig it? Or? Great question. So the, um, the way that we do it is, is the traditional way of doing it, right, would be um, to do a base integrity inspection would be to dig around the pole, drill into it with anywhere from a half inch to a, you know, one inch bit, um, stick a rod in there and kind of test to see what you feel. Um, a little bit more subjective that way. It's still uh, an effective way of doing it the way that we do it. Studies um, have been coming out that when you dig up around the base of a pole, um, it accelerates the decay, yeah, up to 10 times. And so I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, it's actually on Adams Boulevard where we had done that first set, there were some, some older poles there that had been dug up and then they had been creosote wrap, I believe, and, and those ones, I think, had the highest rate of decay and cavity from what we saw. So those were, there. years ago, we had to go through, and uh, when they built that line, Adams Boulevard wasn't there. It was... Interesting. And so, yeah. basically, it had hills and valleys and whatnot. When they, when they built Adams, they filled in the valleys, and so a lot of those poles were filled in above the treat line, and almost every pole that was above the treat was rotting away, and we had some that actually were broke and were, were leaning. So we got a company that came through and, and basically dug down deep and fiberglass and injected the whole thing full of fiberglass mm. and basically trued them up for, I think they did it for like $1,000 a pole or something like that. But uh, I think there were about 10 of them that were identified back in those days. And those were most of the ones that were had been buried above the treat. And so that's why they were rotting away. The and you know, they're still standing today. So yeah. it, it, they it, seem it, to work. I mean, this was 20 some years ago that they did that. It served a purpose. Yeah, yeah. And so, but I guess with that being said, we've, we're, we've taken a, a different approach. Um, it's, it's a quantifiable approach in, in using data with graphs that can go, go, you know, you can go back and look at them and, and understand exactly what's going on inside that pole with using a, a bit that's maybe closer to about an eighth, between a sixteenth and an eighth of an inch, right? Um, without having to do any exposure to the base or um, damage to the pole. So, aerial inspections, you can go ahead. We're, you know, essentially this is growing. It's uh, becoming something that's, uh, you know, happening in California, Florida, all these different places that um, in order to get as many poles inspected as fast as possible with the most quantifiable data um, in the safest manner, people are using UAVs to, to collect the data. And so um, we were able to collect almost 900 poles worth of data in about three weeks. Now on the, on the other side, uh, the data aggregation, right? That's, <laughs> that's the part that uh, a lot of people still try to figure out. But as mentioned earlier, uh, the goal is to keep people safe. Um, you know, and, and uh, be faster in even fixing the poles. So hopefully the data that we provide um, to the city is going to be able to be used to go to a pole specifically, grab the part that's needed, go back out, make the repair um, based off of what we find. Uh, the integrity testing, that's, um, you know, it's going to go ahead, Seth. You pick up on efficiencies. It's going to be a little bit faster. Obviously, you don't have to do the digging. You can actually get the real-time data on the spot um, through the screen on the equipment that we use, not to mention, and, and here's a great example of efficiency. There were guys placing, replacing cross arms, I believe, in a neighborhood while we were doing the integrity inspections. And um, as we were, as they were going down the line, we are doing our, our inspections with the drill. And, uh, and one of the drill, the poles that we had drilled came up as a fail. And so with that being said, they had intentions of replacing the cross arms. Um, we had shared with them, hey guys, don't know what your plans are with this pole, but just so you know, we're here with the city doing this inspection. And this pole did fail our integrity test. And so they were able to go ahead and replace the pole then and there, rather than replacing cross arms, going back out and then having to replace the pole later. Um, less intrusive. 
and then uh, it's purely data driven. So um, that's that's the beauty of, of the equipment that we're using, um, and that's the purpose of us just uh, explaining, I guess, why we chose it. So as far as understanding the, the ratings that we give, uh, there's, there's three different ratings um, on every poll. Uh, there's going to be a pass rating, a marginal rating, and then a fail rating. And so we'll go through just some examples um, on that uh, to show. Um, so you, you guys uh, have uh, the oldest line we've ever inspected, um, <laughs> but you, you also have uh, several poles that have passed and have been replaced. Um, so I think uh, with, uh, we were excited about both because we got to see some of the photos and polls and equipment that we've only seen in textbooks. Um, but uh, we also were able to see that, uh, uh, right, that as, Mar uh, as Dennis mentioned, um, the, you have a lot of polls that are still in really good condition. Uh, so here, here's an example of a, a, a good poll. Uh, it's been changed out recently with new cross arms, and there was, there's really nothing to say. It would get a pass, pass rating. This is actually what comes back on the drill from the integrity inspection standpoint. And so essentially the way that the drill works is as it's reading, it's measuring the resistance um, against the needle. It's, it's spinning, I believe it's 4,000 revolutions per minute. Um, and as it detects uh, resistance, it's going to give that feedback back. It's, uh, it's amplitude measured over distance. And so um, essentially, Every single one of those spikes, the larger spikes is, um, the way that we understand it is, it's, it's a ring on a tree. And so if you know anything about, I guess, uh, cutting down trees is the background that I have. I worked for the Forest Service for a couple of years, so I um, did a little bit of uh, sawyering. And so when I look at this graph, really what I'm looking at is holding wood. And as, as you see it, this is also, we wanted to start with a pass rating. This is a great pole here. You've got holding wood in the middle that's strong, that's your core. And as it goes out, it's consistently up, going up and down. And so this would be um, considered a pass, 0% decay, 0% cavity. Um, and that's what we're looking at on this one. You drill all the way through the pole. Great question. Yeah, so the, the, the readings that we take, um, the first one is always going to be horizontal. That detects the diameter. It actually, the needle comes out of the, uh, the pole by two inches. And by using that measurement, we then take a 30 degree measurement at the base of the pole, um, which once we have the, di the diameter reading, we know that the depth needs to be at 30 degrees so that we don't hit dirt on the other side um, to detect the percentage of cavity and decay. What size bit? You said eighth inch bit? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say it's about an eighth of an inch. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, a, a marginal rating is one where it still needs to be inspected, um, but there's no, uh, there's a little less sense of urgency. Um, so anything that we're marking with yellow or marginal are ones that uh, we did detect issues with, and uh, we, it is something that you'll want to go and send uh, someone out uh, to, uh, to do further inspection. Uh, but an example, a few examples that we put uh, in your slides there is, uh, this is one that has cross arms that have the, uh, the wooden pegs. Uh, this, is, this is a perfect example of one that we had seen in textbooks. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's not, uh, not used uh, very often. Uh, but you can see that there's splitting that's happening, uh, which uh, uh, can cause the damage, um, which uh, then can cause the insulators uh, to, uh, to come loose. Um, so with, uh, um, with that, um, on, uh, this was the same pole. Uh, it also had a transformer that showed signs of leaking. Uh, that was uh, either a faulty transformer or it's uh, an overloaded line. And so you can see the insulation there on the, uh, the uh, line going in from the, uh, the switch that uh, is actually melted. Uh, so that's, we, we would suspect that that's from an overloaded line going into the transformer. Uh, and you can see tracking um, in the, uh, uh, the uh, switch that's, uh, that's in the, that bottom left at the, the top there with the box that actually is showing electricity uh, is likely traveling outside of that uh, and causing that uh, coloring or damage. So sounds really concerning, but this pole is still standing, the line's still up. So something that you'd want to go out and inspect uh, but the level of urgency on that really is uh, for, for you guys to determine along your regular maintenance. And in this case, um, 
if the pole didn't need to replace, but they identified a significant maintenance item, then we would just go take care of that, especially if it's high risk. And and we did when and Marvis and I. This is all fresh, hot off the press, so you're seeing it about the same time we are. So <laughs> as we sit down and identify those maintenance items, then they'll just go into the work order system and the they'll get taken care of as quick as they can get to them. Um, when they're just those types of maintenance items that don't necessarily require a pole replacement. And, and the beauty is, as well, is um, we didn't put the full-sized images in this presentation. However, all of the, uh, the images that were taken were as high as 22 megapixels for resolution. And so the, the beauty is, is when the report is delivered, it's going to be... Um, Digital, it's going to be able to be referenced to um, the the bottom left hand picture. Like the, as Seth had mentioned, this is a marginal rating, and the way that we recommend marginal is um, to be treated is that they should be put on a plan, as you said, Dennis. Right, and so essentially, at a certain point in time, this this needs to be addressed, and whether that's one year, two years, right, it's really uh, the decision of your guys's um, team. But you can blow these pictures up and look at an insulator and. What you may not be able to see on the screen from where you're sitting, but on the bottom left-hand picture, on the top left-hand corner, that's an insulator that has tracking on it, and tracking is basically when electricity moves through a different, you know, potentially atmospheric uh, uh, conditions, right? So, like, dirt, as an example, might conduct something and cause tracking. So, you're going to be at work. We're identifying these anomalies. And, uh, and presenting them and reporting them in a quantifiable yeah. manner. And, and you'll have things, uh, we'll document things like this transformer, the bolt needs to be tightened. So yeah. it's, it's major things all the way down to the little things. It's the guy that, if he was up in a bucket truck, he'd be giving you that report. Um, and have that. Correct. Yeah, so the, we've got an arrow there on that, and there'll be a note so that, uh, so that you guys know when you go out, you'll get a full report on what needs to be done. Here's the marginal uh, hole from the integrity inspection standpoint. Um, as you can see, your hold, when you have strong holding wood, you're going to see the graph with strong spikes. When the holding wood is less strong, if there's decay or if there's cavity, um, it's going to do a little bit more of a flat line. Um, with that being said, a marginal rating, so parameters are set prior to doing all of our drilling. Um, a pass rate for decay is 35% or less, marginal is 36% to 60%, uh, and a fail is 61% to 100% decay. The percentages for cavity is, a, is it's different. It's going to be 0 to 15% is pass, 15 to 20% is marginal, and 21% to 100% is going to be a fail because cavities are a little bit more of a, you know, they need more serious attention. And so, in, in this case, this is going to be a an example of a marginal reading where you'll see um, between centimeters uh, roughly seven and, and 16 we picked up enough decay and cavity to have that past the thresholds that were previously set and to put it in the marginal so cavity. So what is that cavity? Is it basically just rotted real punky wood? I mean is yeah it, was so moisture moisture had been introduced somehow or other or into it and yeah, some wooden. of these poles we've we've estimated to be dated at seventy years old. Some yeah, were, they, were they the Western Red Cedar, or were they? Did you know what kind of wood they were? I mean, I know some of them came from the TVA years ago. I mean, I'd, I'd heard that the tags on them the uh, weren't uh, weren't very visible, so uh, we yeah. would we would assume so. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I know when they built the town in 1931, that's where the, some of the poles were used. They're impressive. They are some of the hardest woods that we've we've drilled into in the past. We've broken more bits in Boulder City than we've broken anywhere else. When we, when we had spoken with the manufacturer, we said, guys, what's going on? And they said, how hard is the wood? Where are you at? And we told them, and, and essentially that was, that was the answer. And everybody was pretty, pretty shocked. But I mean, it, they've stood the test of time and, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, hard wood. <laughs> So uh, the, the decay could be introduced by a split in the wood. It could have just been the tree uh, to begin with, and it's just something that's slowly over time. Um, or it could be uh, introduced by some other damage uh, that was caused. Yeah, there's a multitude of factor. I mean, even just the way that water drains down uh, a passageway on a sidewalk, right? Yeah. And so 
I had a question. You have different lines on your graph there, and so why are they different, the measurements? Are you, um, which lines are you referring to? Well, there's a, there's a black tracer. There's one you've shaded blue, and then underneath that, there's sort of black lines around. Is are those different measurements you made, or? They, they are. So you've got the uh, you've got a measurement that is the uh, going into the pole. You've got another one coming out, measuring the resistance as it's coming back out, and then you've also got decay and cavity being measured. So those are all the the lines on the graph. So why is the measurement coming back out different to the measurement going in? It's measuring the same thing, I guess. Uh, it's the resistance. So once the built bit's gone in, there's going to be a different amount of resistance than when it's coming back out. Okay, and how accurately do you think you can measure that resistance? I mean, what are the errors on your measurements? Um, this is the, um, I, I know saying that this is the, the highest degree of accuracy that's out there in the industry is uh, uh, vague. Um, but it, but it is. We have a uh, there was a ninety t high high nineties percent of accuracy. I, I believe it was out of two hundred poles, one came back that needed two drillings. So that's when they ended up telling us that every pole requires at least two below ground drillings. I don't know what percent it to what. I don't want to labor the point, but my point is you're sure. quoting numbers here. Correct. Right. We have numbers, percentages, 20, 21, 50. How accurate is that number? Do you know that? If you don't know, Those it's all, okay. Well, milliamp, they're actually milliamps, aren't they? I mean, they, they, the mm. amperage draw of the drill that's going in there, as it hits something hard, it's going gonna, it's gonna to spike up. You're drawing more amperage. It's probably just milliamps. Which no, I'm not asking the units. I'm asking the error in the number, plus or minus For, From what we've been told, um, 0.05%, right? So yeah. out of 200 poles, one, one came back that needed two drillings, but what... Okay, what yeah. I'll, I'll ask you later. It's okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. And that, that is why when, uh, when we're doing these, we can drill more uh, to make sure that we're improving the, the accuracy and making sure that it's not just a spot that we were drilling, but under 1%. So as far as the fail ratings, um, you know, the, uh, these are the ones where we recommend you uh, take immediate action uh, to get out to. And from the aerial perspective, um, there, this was the minority as far as the, from the equipment. Uh, that was out there, but this is an example of uh, a pole that's showing severe decay uh, and uh, splitting across the top. Um, and then uh, you can see that it's got the, well, the it's got a broken cross arm as well as the uh, um, insulator that's uh, leaning because of that break. Um, so this is some this is an example of of one that uh, right should be uh, addressed with some some degree of urgency. Uh, as far as some other ones, here's another one with the, the neutral line on the insulator is the one that's, uh, that's leaning over. Um, you can see that, uh, right, that, that could be a bird landing on it and the uh, neutral line hits the hot and here at that point you've got an outage. So uh, another example of something that might, uh, that would be considered a fail. And then um, on this side, um, we had uh, we're just showing that the transformer looked good. However, it was uh, it looked like the uh, the switch or the fuse uh, on this side was not connected. So you had some equipment that's up there that maybe could be uh, maybe could be removed, um, and it was being fed uh, by the hot on the other side uh, as far as the the transformer. So things that we'll note in the report, so that when they're going up there, they can uh, be doing cleanup as well. This is what a fail rating would look like. So in this case, um, we detected 56% decay and 50% cavity, which then passed our thresholds of what, what a map marginal or a pass would be. And so this would be considered a failure. Um, you'll see in the graph, um, the flat line is in the middle. Your holding wood is deteriorating. And it's, it's basically, it's, it's amplitude, which is essentially your highest peaks measured and compared to the equilibrium of the rest of the peaks. And so that's, that's how the measurements are taken, that's how the calculation is, is produced, and that's what's written in the software for the equipment. But this would be a failure. Um, and, and as you can see, there's, there's still good holding wood on each side. There were some that the holding wood or the, the wood had decay or cavity on the outsides. This was one that had it in the middle. So what you would probably picture here if you were to cut into this pole is, I don't know if you've ever, you've ever been hiking, but when a tree falls down, right? And the center of it starts to decay and you can kind of pull at it, things like that. But the out, the outer shell is still holding. That's, 
that's probably what's going on without having to dig up this pole or drill into it with a larger bit, right? Um, that's that's the information that we were able to gather. So those those three ratings then are going to be in the summary, um, and then there will also be a detailed report based on the pole ID uh, along with the lat long coordinates for each one uh, that we took. Um, but just overall, um, we had the uh, um, we do have it on a map so that we can we can pull that up uh, based on uh, the results. And uh, from a, a summary of what we found overall, combining um, hmm, um, combining the uh, uh, drill data along with the aerial inspection, there's about a 60% pass rate. Uh, that should uh, that category name should be pass. Um, you've got about a 10% marginal. And when you combined on the fail rate, there was about a 30% fail rate uh, across the system. The uh, majority of those fails were the actual integrity tests uh, and not the, uh, the visual inspections, uh, which just goes to show the, the benefits of doing that 360 inspection of both the integrity along with uh, the, the aerial. So the, uh, the final report, uh, Dennis has not seen that yet, but uh, he'll be seeing that early uh, next week that'll have all the details that you guys need and uh, we're uh, available to answer any questions or comments. Um, and uh, uh, Luke, Luke's the guy you'd be reaching out to. And George, I apologize if I didn't uh, answer your question that you were asking. And if you want, I could get back to you. Maybe we could talk after. And I can yeah, I don't want to be pedantic about it. I just like to know uncertainties on numbers. It's okay. The other, Absolutely. Speaking of arithmetic, the numbers that we have don't actually add up to your number of trees. So you've got in the graph that we have with the fail, you actually list numbers and you got like 100 trees missing and those were added in after into your thing? Or? And yes. Is that what happened? Good observation. And so um, what we had initially sent, I believe it was Monday evening, Tuesday, Tuesday morning, it's hard to tell at those times, um, <laughs> was uh, our integrity inspection data. Um, and so there were actually more pieces or assets that were inspected from the, from the UAV. And yep, so those, those are the, the wooden poles that were drilled. Uh, and, and you do have 120 metal light poles that were not drilled as well. So the, the final inspection will be uh, including all of those for you guys. Yeah. Yep. Good observation. So, so you actually <clears throat> looked at the steel poles around town and basically the base to see if they were rusted out or they would possibly break loose and we, fall. We over. did a visual inspection of those and then the aerial inspection. Did you find very many of those that were bad? Uh, those all passed. Yeah. That's good. Good. I guess I'm make sure I understood. Was that late poles or all the all the ready, the steel poles? for the, uh, what is it, the transmission. Six transmission still poles that we have? Uh, we did not do the transmission except for the Adams Boulevard. We did some uh, on that, but uh, that was the uh, light poles, the metal light poles. Yeah, because I think what Buchanan is the big Yeah, yeah the old transmission, yeah, that's all. That's, uh, but they're, they're not real old, are they? they? They're not real old, are they? The no, they're 20, they're 30, 25, 30 years old. Yeah, yeah we're getting there, but still those hopefully would last long. Well, the problem with those is they weren't designed for the underbuild. It's gotcha. part of the problem. The, the metal. Holes going back in will be metal with the, the replacement. Ones, the ones on Adams. Oh, not the ones on Buchanan. Not the ones on Buchanan. Buchanan. Oh, correct. I'm sorry, Adams. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, anything? Anybody have anything else? That was impressive. Yes. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Out, really. Appreciate, appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so Dennis, how did you want to do the capital improvement tonight? So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on it tonight, um, and then we can spend a little more time Monday. But um, there's the ongoing CIP progress update summary. You know, as you can imagine, in 30 days, not a whole lot changes. Eileen caught that we still haven't fixed the one uh, where there was a, an amount misapplied between the... Um, 4 to 12 kV and the 69 kV, so that still needs to be fixed in the system. Probably the most, uh, the biggest change that's happened, and you can see it just by going out on a Nevada way, is um, they've got all the poles in from uh, substation 3 to where Nevada way turns and goes north. So the only poles remaining are basically, I don't know, there's probably 
12 poles left to be uh, anchored. Um, and then they'll start pulling uh, the conductor and we still anticipate they'll, they'll be done by the end of April um, with that project. Um, the other uh, recent one that I want to bring up because it really isn't shown on here from a monetary perspective is that we, um, and I'm really focusing on electrical because that's really where the money is. Um, we've got the bids in for the um, design build for the BC tap to Buchanan along Adams there. Um, there were two bidders. One was um, Sturgeon Electrical. Um, and one was par electrical. Um, they both came in and did presentations for staff. Um, suffice it to say that the planning and the uh, expertise from par far outweighed um, Sturgeon. Sturgeon left many, many, many items on the table and their cost estimate was way off base. And so um, we're moving ahead with negotiating with PAR Electrical. We are looking at doing it in phases. They have indicated to us, and, and I could provide more of this information. I, I talked to Larry about this. We're getting more information from them, but they're indicating that if they, if we get this contract to council um, relatively soon, they could complete the project and the entire project within about a year, which is... Um, frankly was better than I thought they could do so that that it, that would take get that first phase done so we could fire up the the uh, transformer at the BC tap and and do that real live load testing versus uh, just the testing you do with the with the transformer on site so that design build would include the, the 69 on top and the two double underbuild two, two underbuild circuits yes underneath. can you you know what conductor size is a 954 on the he does 954 and what, what's the distribution and going to be 654 and 636 okay right. good. good. I think that's one of the confusing parts we're still trying to understand as a committee here is that um, I think at one point and to help for us to help the council I think if we can see you mentioned something about the proposals but if it's going to be a done deal before or when we're seeing <laughs> the proposals, it doesn't do us a whole lot of good or do, we can't we can't do you guys a whole lot of good if we find something um yeah that's where it gets a little fuzzy for me to be honest with you between what the committee's uh, responsibilities are at that operating level versus recommendation at the, we're not at the, we're not asking the operating but if you're asking the council to pass something mm -hmm. then wouldn't it be advantageous for us at least to look get a better look than just the three days just like yes yeah, so days before the yeah meeting. so what we yeah and i wouldn't um you know the, that project itself you know is certainly necessary and needs to be done um I guess I'm trying to better understand, I guess, what it would be that you would want to see. It, would it be the contract as it's drafted? That's certainly doable. Yeah, the contract. Or, or just guess, kind of the proposal. Um, well, the contract would definitely be because there's just some things that some of us might see. Even, mm -hmm. Like one of the things I saw there was it wasn't a, in one of the contracts we were looking at, there wasn't a there wasn't a termination date. And right. So little things like that that might have slipped through, we can help on that. And, you know, we're a freebie. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yes, we can that... certainly get, I mean, there's still quite a bit of work to be done on that. So I don't I don't see a problem with. But I guess you're, so, so I'm, you, when you I don't mentioned think that the council to be, to approve it. Eventually, but I don't, you know, that would be, um, I can't imagine that would go to council in March. Uh, I don't think they would be ready. I'd have to circle back with Public Works and see where they are. But but I guess the proposal, and because then it, then you would have the the conductor line, the conductor. So we can just sort of see what what the overall proposal is and what the contract, yep. what the, the proposed mm -hmm. contract is. Yep. So we. So that know. would be something we may not be able to get. You know, for. Um, 
it doesn't uh, seem to be we would have to wait to have a meeting. We could just get that out to the committee and get comments back individually. Sure, I, that would be fine with me. And, and if that, anybody else, that would I think from a timing perspective that would work. Yeah, that would yeah. be okay. that would be fine. Yeah, we can. I, do that. I think the more we can understand because I, I'm not sure that was in our direct. Um, I guess we need to go back and look at our what was in the resolution, but the resolution was a, was a basic aspect. Mm -hmm. And I thought I thought that was one of the things we were going to do is basically we're acting as free consultants on some and, of this you know, stuff. That's, you know, the, the only thing is from a city and staff liability, we just have to be a little careful on how we manage that. So not advice is always good and we can take it and do take that advice. Um, it would be something if it was something significant that was a modification, it would probably go back to the designer for consideration, but it may, it may not be, or we may come back and said, no, there's a reason we can't do that. Does that I understand. And we all, we all understand, we, this is, this, we have no approval. Right. We're, it, we're at advisory, so that's what right. I'm talking about, just stuff that's yeah. advising. We were not saying, hey, you can't do this, we can't. We're right. just saying we see something in there, but if we, some of these things that have happened, it's like, well, here's gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> so right. It's gonna happen, and so, we, I'm just trying to get a better understanding, and the sooner we yeah. can see some of the stuff, the better. So, yeah, if you can just yeah. even send it to us as the committee beforehand and say, hey, whenever you can get, you know, what the, you want to tell us, you give us a, a week or whatever to review it, then that's fine. Yeah, I would expect it to take a little bit. They've only had one meeting. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. I mean, they only had the first scoping meeting with, with PAR last week, so it'll, it'll take a little bit of time. But as soon as we have the draft, we can send it out. Appreciate it. Well, then it's going to be like series of tech memos and design uh, need to design. If you're going to do a design build, so, you're going to have. So the intent and in, in the way we've kind of talked to them about it is they would start the design on phase one um, and start and provide, you know, the typical 30, 60, 90. Mm -hmm. But they would, and we would focus on phasing the construction so they could get moving on the phase one and then continue with design 30 60 90 so there would be design there would be multiple design packages but i would think like a 60 percent design package would certainly be something we would be interested in right before it got to 90. and we when and we also, certainly we've even had some discussions with them on ways 30 to would seem a little premature but maybe not but right i mean the we're gonna comment we won't be able to comment there'll be all kinds of comments at 30 percent I mean, right so and you know they're gonna there's different levels of uh complexity complexity you know that the they they already strung the wire to the starting pole out mm -hmm. of the bc tap so it's relatively should be relatively straightforward from the bc tap to substation three and where it's going to get a little more Difficult, I guess, is when you get into uh, phases two and three over to be. Are you doing any underbuild at all from three that direction back to the east? Yes. Are you good? One circuit? Uh, For, uh, back to the towards the east, back towards the tap. Are you building any just one underbuild circuit? No. Wouldn't it be wise to maybe put one just frame, maybe not frame for it, but, not, but just frame for it or something? Oh, it does have does okay. All right, so there is a way to feed that area if we have to someday with twelve. Then, oh, that's that's smart. Okay, and that's why Marvis is here. I'd be confused by the numbers because the BC tap to Buchanan in the CIP document you have it says eight million dollars in the utilities electric division, and it says nine point one million dollars lower down. And then one of the finance people quoted $9.4 million. And that's big variations in the numbers within the document, let alone. So the budgeted amount is 9.1. I can tell you that. Why does uh, it say eight then in the summary? Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at that summary. Well, that's a different summary. I think that's, 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 that's the old summary. Yeah. But I mean, why is the old summary and the new summary? Well, I can tell you, and when we did. Go forward, go forward. George, when we updated the budget for FY20, we modified that cost estimate because it had never been adjusted. Right, but I mean, shouldn't the numbers be, I understand the numbers are different. His 9.1 is in there, but it's not at the top. Why, shouldn't these numbers be consistent? It's not at the one, I'm sorry. It's not, there's two different numbers given, eight and 9.1. And I'd have to look at, I can take a look at them after here, but I can tell you this, we did, 
adjust the budget because we were very concerned about the original cost estimate. And so I don't remember what the exact number was right. historically, but we did boost that to 9.1. And in fact, the bid itself came in a little bit higher, so. So that's maybe where the 9.4 that I heard from the finance people came from? Or? Uh, could be, yes. That was anecdotal, she just said. So there's yeah. kind of numbers drifting around. For us, it's kind of difficult to make recommendations well, when the numbers are fluctuating by $1.4 well, million. And, dollars. and George, let, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, the budget is the budget is, but we didn't, now we're at a point with that project that we're getting a real number. If right. we're within 8 to 10% on an engineering estimate, that's actually pretty good, believe it or not. And that's going to happen with all projects. I think what's um, complicating this a little bit is real time we're getting these bids and you're looking at the CIP and they're different and they're always going to be different. We, yeah, yeah. You know what, does, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I understand say? things are going to fluctuate, but they seem like... No, but you know, the, it'd the, be the, good the, to know why. Let's well, see. why I, is I, it $1.4 million right, dollars more? Right, so I can tell you this right now because when I first got here, I took a lot. To, we we took a, a look at that estimate, and we said it was it was developed five years ago. It needs to be updated, um, and so we updated it from the eight to the nine point one. Now we have a real number with the bid coming in that is higher, and that'll have to go to council for a budget amendment. And that's what happens with the capital improvement program. Sometimes the projects come in lower and sometimes they come in higher. No, no, I don't disagree that things will fluctuate. Right. But the question is why? Why is it 1.4? Just saying it was five years ago, something's got cheaper in the interim. Something's mm -hmm. got more expensive. Poles got way more expensive. So um, that's where a lot of that cost. So there is, it's possible to pinpoint where that difference came from? No, not in that case. In that case, I adjusted it up, made a, I made an executive decision that said, this is not enough. There's no, and we, we knew that right. because we had gotten the bids for the 69 KV loop. So we knew. So you just said 10% just out of thin air because that's kind of in your, I'm not accusing, I'm just yeah, saying that, in your experience, things in, fluctuate. So if we waited another five years, it might be another 10%. Yeah, so typically what you would want to do is have your engineer go back, revise the estimate, and get it as accurate as possible. In, the, in, the, in this case, I knew that we were well below what it was going to cost because we had the numbers for the 69 KV loop. And we knew how, we, we just, we knew that it was going to be more based on the, the projects. Those two projects are similar. Um, I think it would be useful to explain to them, because yeah. we're supposed to report to the council. It would be right. useful to explain to them with numbers, okay, here are the costs of the polls. They went up 10% mm -hmm. in this with quotes, and then you can gauge better what's going on. Yeah. And in case I look like a lunatic, I refer you to the uh, video of yesterday where the mayor was very concerned with the costs and wanted to mm -hmm. see things in more detail than he's being provided with. Yep. So I don't think I'm out of line. I'm trying to be in, in line with right. the people we're reporting to. Mm -hmm. We're going to get grilled if we just say, well, they said so. That's good right. enough for us. We don't know why they said so. No. We're going to be viewed just as critically. No. In this case, it was us making that decision because we knew the cost for the 69 KV loop. And so we adjusted what we thought was accordingly. I think there was still some misunderstanding. So I think what George is saying, we're still, because this was back in November, the document we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And I think there was still some confusion because you had, in the beginning part of the document, you just had, um, what was it called? It was the uh, the project cost, and then it was just fis uh, fiscal year 20. Right. And so, and I'm not sure that included some of the out years it did. So, like, when you go down to the other ones where you've got it further out, then you've got the cost of the 250000 in fiscal year 22, which gives you a little bit more, but it's still... But I think I, I agree with what he's saying is we do... I understand that we're still trying to get all the numbers together, and part of it is is, is that I think... I guess I'm asking how much are we going to see on the ninth because you sort of we've got three issues right now you've got what we're going to bring forward um so what's going to happen in 2020 21 you've got what's going to be brought forward um what you're asking for for just 2021 
And then you had what the um, consultants believe will actually be spent. So there's a possibility of three budgets just for 2021. Well, the consultants were, will take what we give them from a cash flow perspective, which doesn't match up with the budget and typically doesn't. Now, in some cases, you know, we're, we're guessing because of the capacity for us to be able to get the projects done. Um, or something changes, or there's a permitting issue that, that slows a project down. There's all those things. So the budget is just what the budget is. We try to be as accurate as we can with cash flow for the rates model, um, because that's determining when you need the revenue to do the project. Um, so it, typically, and frankly, because we're a pay-go um, city, the best way, the way we should and this would be something we could ask the consultants, but in, in my opinion, we should put the entire budget up front. It should be known that this is a total project cost of $9.5 million, and you know we can guess <laughs> the time, whatever it is, we can guess the time frame, um, but in the case of the the PAR contract we just did, you know, I, we anticipated it to be um, longer. And now they're coming back. It took us a while to get to it, but from the proposal process to uh, completion based on the schedule we're seeing, it's 18 months. Well, we anticipated it would be over a two-year period. So that's where, you know, we just don't always have it perfect as it relates to cash flow versus of the budget. No, I understand, but, it, but I guess basically trying to, because it looks, I don't know if, and I don't know if you have any idea, Ned, of how much in the past the, the capital was sort of pushed around a lot like it is now, because we, did, we didn't have that many projects going, so that's, there's a lot, of, there's a lot in the works right now, so I, I can feel some of the frustration that uh, there's just so much going on that it's hard to to pin anything down until you actually get the hard numbers coming in from the bids. So. But I, I guess for me, you know, and, and I think it's good that the rate consultant will be there on Monday because he can, I think, help with some of this discussion because um, the, the rate consultant knows knows how much money we have. They, they've, they've got from finance what's going to roll forward. They're going to have the FY21 budget from an operating and capital perspective with what's tentative. And we can talk to them a little about that. We know right now there's sufficient revenue for the proposed 21 projects. Um, and even the if, you know, in the financial plan we saw, um, I believe that was even at 22 and 23. So um, we don't have a lot of the, the 69 KV project is the only multi-year project. So we have the ability and you have the ability as the committee to work on the, the longer term CIP as part of the rate process. And really it's just trying to, to see if we can come to some determination are we comfortable with 21 are you are you, how do we get you comfortable with moving forward what's recommended in FY21 because that's what we need sooner rather than later we still have the ability to um, kind of move uh, the outer years if or see what those impacts are and potentially push those projects out I think the priority of the projects shouldn't change as far as the backbone infrastructure. So what you see in the electrical is what I would consider the master plan of the backbone infrastructure that needs to re be replaced. And most of those projects, one has to be completed before the next one could be completed before the next one could be completed. And that's kind of how they're prioritized. And so we can come Monday night again pull out that electrical plan and, and show that to you um, but for purposes of the rate study I think you know we're not ready and I don't believe you would be ready either to say you're comfortable with this entire master plan from FY21 to FY25 right because you haven't seen the results of the rate stuff 
Right. Yeah, we're not we're not there yet because we're if, what we need to for the report and the vote on April first is I guess twenty one. Yes. But we it would still be a, a nice to have a priority of what is currently going on and what we expect. So I'm not mm. sure we'll have that. But I, I'm sort of thinking we're not going to get that by April first. So I don't know how what we do. But you've got thirteen point nine million dollars just in electrical. Mm -hmm. We're not going to spend thirteen point nine million. We can almost we're pretty sure that we're not going to spend that thirteen point nine right. million. Um, you, it almost looks like if you sort of gauge, look it down, and see your percentages, you can almost say that there's a good chance there would be seven million that would be carried forward. Right. So you're looking at seven point eight plus another seven million. So you've got you've got close to you've got over you've got up to fifteen million dollars. Right in 2021 now right and so then is all so is is are we going to be able to catch up so to speak you'll you'll catch up relatively quick because we've got quite a few in design as you can see here you, you can also see that um you know you're going to catch up because the schedule as it's drafted from par electrical is nine point one million plus or minus whatever it ends up with when we finish negotiating will get done all in 21. Right. So even though it was budgeted over multiple years, 2021 and that little bit of 250,000, that 12, it'll, if, if it, let's say it goes to council end of April, it'll be done by the following April. Okay. And that's, that's, and so the, that, you'll, you know, that takes 9 million right off right there. Right. No, that, not, that's a great project because that so, one shows that because great before what's happening now is right. when we budget six to 7 million in one year, we're, and we're only yeah. spending close to four at a higher point, 4 million. And right. then we keep on coming back and that's confusing a lot of us. Yeah. And so that's why you've got the 69 KV is supposed to be done in this year and looks, this it will be done by the end of april and then the and and then based on the current schedule we just got from par the bc tap to uh buchanan will be done in, all in fy 21. so those are your two main our two main projects yeah. they're two backbones that have to be done and yeah. so that's a good part and i guess that's what i'm just trying to understand mm. and then trying to get narrowed down so we can understand some of this extra money. So today, I, tonight's probably not the best night to go through some of these projects um, to do that Monday night sounds better. But at yep. least on, I think to one of the things we've taken a lot of time up on, but it, to get a good understanding of the Buchanan line now that we're understanding before right. it was like, we, it sounded like it was gonna be another two to three year process. And now we're saying it, the actual construction could be within a year. Yeah, design and construction. Because even if we go in April, you get a contract signed, I doubt we'd see an invoice. We might see a mobilization or something, maybe a couple hundred thousand in this fiscal year. But the reality is the majority will be in FY21. Right. And, and that's, so that's where I'm saying. So trying to, I think, make sure the council understands it, too, is that you're asking for a certain amount of money. But what's going to happen is come July or August, you're going to have all this It goes over. pretty fast. And, it, it, and the 69 KV loop is a... If, even if you take away the issue with the neighborhood um, and you look at the project in general, there's a lot of lead time on the poles. So in that case, and that was a, um, that project, um, if you were to take away that six month of whatever happened there, uh, they didn't really do anything for many months once we awarded the contract because the lead time on the poles was so long. And it's not efficient for them uh, to do much else other than go survey. So um, if you notice, they when they went out there, they, they drilled the foundations, they put the poles up, and that foundation work, I don't think it even started till November of last year. So the time to build, the actual construction time was relatively quick. Um, it's really the lead time on poles that's problematic. So yeah, so those are things that are helpful. I think what we've heard um, from other people, though, too, is is so we've got. I think part of our, like I said, make sure we're saying it right, is is the carry forward from mm -hmm. the other projects. So now we're seeing we've got two major projects that are going to be done are being done in a shorter turnaround time. All so right. we can we can look at the money's going to actually be, we can see the projects being done. Yep. But we still have quite a few projects, just in that are 
that are rebudgeted for this year, right? That are going to flow through this year and have to be rebudgeted into 2021. Right, and we can. Um, I can talk to the rate consultant. Um, you know, they're planning on focusing mostly on the cost of service analysis that they did, but um, we can have them pull up that financial plan so you guys can see what happens to the fund balance with with the FY21 data because I believe they have all that now of the draft you know the tentative data and the operating and then the projects that are in there it doesn't mean they, they and the 21 projects and show you what happens with the fund balance yeah because right now the one we, the last report we got showed um, basically nine million that need to be used from the fund it was over 10 but we had a certain amount that was transferred in for this year mm -hmm. and we're not going to use we're not going to spend that no pretty, it doesn't look like that no so, probably not but so hopefully that can be updated so we can understand that you'll have actually more money in reserve going forward going yes. forward because you won't be spending it yeah my like, my memory was and I'm, my memory's not as good as it used to be but they they really weren't um it was towards the end of the event horizon for the five-year CIP where that fund balance was getting down. It was to 23, I think, part of 22, 20, 22 or 23. 23, yeah, 23 big, somewhere like in there. And so, that they were and, and so that's when I think we have some flexibility to um, maybe manage the projects a little different to make sure there's sufficient revenue to cover those with, you know, potentially without having to do a rate increase. Right, right. Because there, well, we should have enough money. It looked like cause even even with this large amount that we're carrying. No, forward, th there's certainly not a rate increase necessarily for twenty. And I'm talking just electrical now. Twenty one or twenty twenty one, twenty two. I don't see that. Right, right. So, but I guess so. The best we can do is to try to do, and that's we'll be talking a little bit more this evening. So it's gonna take a little longer. Is the report? Yes. Um, so I guess ask get a few maybe bullets um, discussed about the report, but I, I'm still not sure by April 1st, we're still going to have enough data to say the committee can really, we can say this is the information we have. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if we have to say that we don't have enough information to give, we almost probably do, because we still don't have the full information. So for the information we're looking at, and I guess the big thing is, is how much we go over the backbone um, on Monday, is that's what because that's what has to be done. That's what backbone. has to be done. And so, how much in 2021 is the backbone? Mm, and most has, of it. Okay. And if that's yeah. the case, then yeah. and so if we can talk about that Monday, that might be helpful. Yep. And then the thing is, I guess, is if there's anything that's currently in the system that really doesn't have to be done that was put in there for some other reason and isn't there is no there most most of them are high priority but that doesn't mean they can't move a year okay and if and or or level out or something like that and and so you know with the rate model we can we could do those runs real time moving capital to see how it impacts right uh, so the rate consultant could do that they, I don't know if they could do that Monday night, but uh, they could do that probably in the meeting in April. Yeah, because I guess because the council needs to know by the end of April, first of May. Um, I have to go back and look at that schedule we had, but April would be preferable. But um, I, to make the finance director the, the comfortable that we're done messing with FY, FY21 sooner is better than later. But. Well, I think we have to get it to them before they vote, right? Yes. So the question is, when do they vote? And it's in May. So I feel yeah, like we have the May. whole month of April to work on this. I was like, why would we want to stop on April 1 when we have four more right. weeks to look at this, when information is coming online? So I suggest we schedule an extra meeting in April to discuss this. I, well, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but I think, let's see... The city council has a the city council work session number three to review final budget is on the twenty second of April. So that's that that's that's the challenge there. And uh, public notice hearing adoption of final budget is in is in um, May. That's the date that matters. Well, but no, they're gonna. That's we need to have it before that. So so does that, and I'm sorry, I don't have that with me. Does that show the date that it has to go to the state? Well, the state, there's a published notice of hearing on the 22nd of May, and the final budget goes on June 1st. Right. Um, so 
I think I think what we need to do is work on have something somewhat available on the first, and if we have problems, then go on. But uh, I think we still I think it's the first that we need. Um, so we have a little bit of time. We can discuss some more issues on Monday. We can discuss this. So we have to make sure on this agenda item that we're working when we talk about the future agendas that we have everything on the agendas that we can discuss it. So what I would um, well. I guess we're not on that item, but that's, we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. Yes. Okay. But I guess that's one thing I'm just trying to get through on. So, I'm, so we're talking some with, so this is still a, the, um, I guess that's the only thing we can ask. So we get further is how much other than the capital improvement do we need? So we're, we'll finish this up really quick and I guess we'll go on right. to the other issues, but the capital. So Monday, the, um, the consultant will, Inter, interact with it mm -hmm. and you'll be able to go down some more lines because for instance we have we still have the El Dorado line on here the El Dorado water line for the water projects and so if we can talk about that more on Monday it might be helpful because yeah. it seems like that should either be we'd want that to have encumbered money or say that no that money is not needed so that would reduce the water budget a reasonable amount because there's almost well there's 500,000 there and then there's design. So I guess the more we understand about that, then that would be something that could be passed along to the council. So you, would, you wouldn't have this money sitting there and it wouldn't be part of the rate process because that's this 2.3 is, is what the consultants are assuming is going to be spent this year. I'm pretty positive that was in their draft. So those are things that would help, yep. I think, all of us. Yep, okay. Um, so to understand Monday. So as far as the related to capital, Well, just for the record, I went and, because I think we're writing a report for the council. So I went and emailed them and asked them, what information do you want from us that would be useful to you in your deliberations? So I think that should dictate what we provide. We're here to advise them. That's in the resolution. So I can share with you now what I got from them, or I can, I don't know, under what agenda item that would be appropriate. Yeah. Let's put it onto the, um, it'd be the next agenda item. Okay, I'll sit tight then and discuss it then. We've uh, gone over a couple different things. Um, Dennis, so derailed you uh, quite a bit. I apologize. But I think the one thing issue is that I think that I really want to hammer down was that I, knowing that the $9 million project can be done by the end of calendar year um, 21. 21 is going to help us a lot as far as, okay, now we've got, we've got money that we've got part of the backbone fixed mm -hmm. and we've got money that's not just hanging out there. Right. And that's a significant amount of that. Yes, yes, and that'll help us a lot. Saying so, and, you know, in this one, the five million is one that's easy for us. I would think the the committee to say this needs to be done, and right. we agree with that that amount. So I guess maybe on Monday, because there's only what five projects. Uh, really, uh, yeah, electrical. I believe it's four or five for electrical. Yeah. And and so if they're all part of the backbone and need to be done, mm -hmm. um, I know the San Philip San. Flipping. And and uh, and I would my just based on what we've seen from the condition assessment for water and sewer, I don't I don't see us necessarily adding anything to twenty one. Right, and it sounds like we had yeah. actually because the money from the leases mm -hmm. um, were covering, covering some of, of that anyway. That was in pretty right. good shape, and that's one thing too. I guess would be to make sure that the council understands on how much we. But it, I think it's becoming clear, but it's still not a hundred percent clear in all the documents right. what is covering what. So. Yeah. But I think it is getting. It's getting. Um, I think it's pretty clear, and it should be clear in the executive summary that was available. Okay. Okay. So, and I don't know if everybody got that. We can we can send it out to you guys. Um, it, it identifies the the, the those dollars, um, and the specific projects they're going to. Okay. So, anything another thing on the capital? Yeah, I mean, I think we're asked to review the, in the resolution the five-year capital plan. So if we decide, well, we don't want to do that, well, that's what we're supposed to do. Well, no, so, I think you do. Okay, uh, I agree just, on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. And, and I think that really is tied to the rate study. I don't, I don't right. see that being tied to getting for, just I mean, coming to a conclusion on 21. The reason I'm sort of raising this issue is because we're supposed to
We've agreed we're going to submit written reports. Someone has to write them. So the chair suggested that I write them, but I can't write them if I don't have the information. If we're not discussing things, if I don't have input, I can write something, but it won't be worth anything. So we want to make sure that we answer the questions that the council wants answered, which I asked them what they want to know, and that we have time to do this in an orderly manner, rather than just saying, well, we'll just worry about FY21, we'll vote April 1st, and we'll just say everything's okay. I don't think that's what they put this committee together for to do. We should take a more thorough look at these things, look but, but, at the but, but think, basis for these numbers, rather than say, well, 9,009 million is good, seems reasonable to me, off we go. But, but and uh, let me throw in something to, to consider the, this committee, neither this committee or this staff have ever had a rate model. So if, if, if we weren't doing a rate study, you would be struggling with the capital plan because you wouldn't even know what the impacts were and we wouldn't be able to tell you other than maybe we have X amount of cash so we can do X amount of projects. But you know we wouldn't have a model that can do the revenue requirements. We So the difference I see is we've got an ongoing rate study that is somewhat complicating it, but at the end of the day, it's going to make it better because if if you and I were sitting here last year and we didn't have a rate study, um, I would it would be even more difficult. <laughs> so I don't uh, disagree with that. Yeah, I mean, I think we need the best information we have. Yeah. But then, if the rate study information comes in, you know, then more question arise, say on Monday, and then we say, well, let's wait another couple of weeks. How are we supposed to deliver a report by April 1 right. that's coherent and a thorough analysis, which is what they want, at least mm -hmm. what's what the mayor wants? We can just say, well, we've, we've met, everything looks okay. That's not really what they had in mind. So then we need to, I don't disagree with you. Okay, let's wait till we get better quality information, but then let's push it out further and have extra meetings to sort out these reports. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just saying, okay, well, we believe the rate guys, five million's good, they've looked at it. It seems in any case, they've decided ahead of time, we're not gonna do a rate increase. So we know what they've concluded, right? You said that two weeks ago. So we already know that. But what we need, when the mayor was going over the budgets, he wanted more detail. He wanted mm -hmm. to know what's in there, not just, okay, five million sounds plausible, mm -hmm. good enough, but what is the basis for that? Mm -hmm. And I think, we can't answer these questions to a satisfaction on the timescales that we're setting this up for. I don't agree, disagree, no, I'm a scientist. We need the best information we have. Right. So we have to sort of manage that together with these deadlines. Yep, okay. Well, let's, let's finish the capital, then next, the next agenda item will go into that in more detail. Um, so, because I've been pushing the capital because I believe the capital is a big issue for the fiscal year 21. It's a big issue for the rate model as well. I mean, it, it is, um, you know, operating doesn't change much. Um, the capital plan drives the rates. It, yes, for, yes. It, it really does. So, and, and, bec and because we're a pay-go, um, you have to generate the revenue before you, before you can do the project. So it's a little different than if we were bond-funded um, and we issued a $40 million ahead of time and it's spent down those bonds, that would, it, it's, it's just a different way of doing business. And it, frankly, it's unusual and it's not a bad thing, uh, but it can make, a, you can have fluctuations when you do that, that you may not have if you bond funded. So um, that's why it, that's why it is important with the rate study specifically that we have, that we're comfortable with the, with the five year CIP for sure. Um, right, for right now, but I think I think what so on the next so the are we going to go over the five year in a little more detail on Monday? Yes. Okay. Okay. So then that will answer part of our question. Not everything I understand. Right, um, and I think it would be useful to um, kind of do the same thing one more time that we did with uh, electrical on the priority in each project. Yes, that'd be very yeah. helpful. Yes, yeah. that's that I think would help quite a bit because there again, I think a lot of it is is trying to bring this carry all this back that we still have some at least from 17 or so this this projects that we're not even going to get done this year. Right. How much is going to get done in the next couple of years? Right. And I think we can explain a little bit about where a little bit in a little more detail, not a lot because I don't think you need a lot, but how those projects came to be. 
Okay, that would be helpful. Uh, because they've been sitting there for a long time and the revenue wasn't there to to do them. So they've been sitting in that capital program for a while, but they haven't been done. Okay, okay. Um, so it, the more we can do that, I think that will help. And then the next thing I'll try to explain my understanding that the committee, if I'm missing something, I'll be happy to, to see what we're what, what we can do. Um, so anything else on the capital then? Eileen? Okay, Ned, you're good. Uh, George, you're good for capital. Here. Okay, so, um, but like I said, the one good thing is I really appreciate that we are seeing that some of the projects are being completed and that we're looking at this, this year and next year, some of the big projects, the big back, backbone are being completed. Right. So that would be, um, and then the other thing, I guess, so the last thing on the capital is, I know it's concerning some people, um, is the transformer. So if we can just get a little more update on that. And is that going to have to have another project or not to complete everything up from no so all we're really waiting for there is is for wapa and their control portion of it so the project is essentially done um the, all that's left is testing the transformer and the control side with with uh, western area but you need the new conductor from bc tap to the three is that part if of you want to put full load on that you have to have that first phase of um the bc tap to Adam's done, and that will be part. Is that part of that? Yes. Okay. That's that's part, part of that's of part of that project, and that would be the first phase. Okay. Okay. That's, I think you mentioned that. But yeah. That's but we'll go. We'll understand. go through that on Monday. That'd but be yeah. very helpful. Yep. So that because that's a big part of the backbone. Once we get that, once you have those two done, um, you've taken care of a lot of the the um, reliability issues um, because you've got the loop done and you've got the BC tap done, and of course you've already got the feed from Mead, so. That takes care of the the radial feed, if, if that's what you want to call it. But um, and then of course, then what you have is the the substation work that needs to be done in some of those feeder projects, and then the finishing of the four to twelve kV stuff. Okay. okay. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. Thank thank you. So now I guess then we'll go to um, possible action, the preliminary discussion of time scales and um, tasks, et cetera, and then the resolution uh, relating to the draft reports to update City Council. So I would like to go to, into a little more detail on that, and then also if I'm missing something um, going forward. So if I can just, I'll, let me sort of get my ideas, because so my idea is that we're not giving the report, we're giving a report on, on as soon as possible. So maybe maybe April 1st, Voting on that might not be as um, optim optimal, but we can see if how we can make it work. And then I guess we can find out that we have some time. Then if we can get another meeting, which we're not having a whole lot of <laughs> luck with getting secondary meetings in the month, but if we can, then I don't have a problem with that if we can get a quorum mm -hmm. and and vote on it and decide if it, if it has to be before um, their 22nd meeting or not. Um, it doesn't have to be. That's the final budget, um, but we still have to see what we need to have something reasonable to get to them. So I guess make sure, George. You know, if I'm missing something, but what the time scale? What we're pushing and rushing with is this fiscal year 21. So that's the report that has to be that the city council. If I understand what this committee is related to, that's the next big step. Um, so the overall five-year plan, that can be done a little bit later. That doesn't have to be done in April. So all we're really doing is, is I believe we're doing a report on this is the information we have so far. So we could either say this is a report for fiscal year 21, or we could say this is the information we've gathered from this committee, sort of right. like you did first place. You sort of did a, bit, a brief one. And, and to make sure everyone understands, those projects will, will still be shown in the out years, but the only thing council approves is 21. So you'll still see them, even if we change them later, you'll see them in the document that, that ends up being approved. Right. So but they don't send a, a five-year plan to the state? They send a... They send a bunch of forms that don't even look like they're different from anything I think you even see. Uh, based on whatever the state format requires. I'd, I'd have to ask finance that, but I don't even think it looks like our 
our document. So they don't vote on the capital improvement plan, whether they decide yes. to accept it or not? Who's they? The council. Yes. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. We need to get that no. information. Right. So that's, that, what, so that's that, what it says in the resolution. Right. So that tentative, that executive summary has FY21 for the entire city, the, the proprietary funds as well as the general fund. So that's what they vote on. No, they vote on the capital improvement plan, don't that, they? That's what I mean. That's what's in there. That's what that is. That executive summary is, well, it's the entire... No, it has four years and it has one year missing, which is the fifth year. It does, but the only thing they're approving is 21. In but George, they're... George, in most, what in most cases, about? what you have is, is you're, you're really trying to focus, unless I'm missing something, you're trying to focus on... So, Eileen, you've done it more than we have, so maybe you can... I might have missed something, but in most cases, you're... When we were doing something like in the Hoover, you're looking at the first three to five years, and you were trying to make those as exact as you could. You were at a 10-year plan. The last five years, that was a big guess. Well, yeah. I, I was at a council meeting a while back where the finance director asked the council to approve the five-year plan because she had to get it to the state mm -hmm. by a certain date. Yeah, so, so we can... We so can... that is turned into the state... Like a month or two ago. Yeah, and it's turned in annually. Um, no, I think it doesn't go until whatever the date on that. Uh, no, there was another one that she said that it had to be. Okay, to we, the can, state we can follow up on that. A oh. certain date, and okay. that's why she pushed the approval of the five year plan. Well, there's yeah. supposed to be a pre, and, and, like and, a pre to the state, but then the final shouldn't have to be. So, yeah, there's, I think what's happening is we're very different. But, but Harry, I can tell you this with certainty. The only thing that gets approved from a budget perspective is FY21. Yeah, because I, 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 I understand what you're saying. So just, and George, I, it says what happens is in most cases, we want 21 to be the best we can. On Monday, hopefully we can get a better idea of what the backbone is. And if I'm mm -hmm. understanding correctly, the most of the, through 2025 is the backbone. Right. And so we're trying to get the backbone understood. If we can get a better understanding of the backbone, then we can probably say this looks reasonable. The city council, as best of our understanding, looks looks reasonable. Then they've got next year. Then we're going to be looking at 2021, and then the other years are going to be. They're going to try to put the priorities down more. So it's hardly anybody says this five year. You're approving it, and it's it's written in stone. Those five years aren't going to be written in stone. I think that's what Dennis is trying to say. The 21 is going to be close. 21 is going to be close. Um, we want the five years to be close as possible for the rate study and the rate. I'm not claiming anything's written in stone. The numbers are changing by enormous numbers on a, on a daily basis. The question is what we're asked to do by the resolution. The resolution doesn't say approve fiscal year 21. It says approve the five-year plan. That's what, that's what dictates what we do, not what we'd like to do, but what we're told to do by the resolution, which was discussed a year ago, last January. Okay, so why don't we do what we're told to do rather than what we'd like to do? And, and how do you... How do you suggest we do that with the data we have? Well, that's exactly the point. We don't have enough data, so we have to push a date out to where we can do the maximum we can as the new information becomes available. Can and, I, uh, so now the question is, are people available to meet in April or not? So is there anyone here who, who's going to be out of the thing for the whole month of April? Or? Can I suggest, um, so we have the first meeting in April. Yes. Uh, what I would suggest is that we have minimal items and that it's just focused on the capital plan. That's the meeting. That's what I would do in April. And if we have to have a second meeting in April, we do that too. Okay, that, that's and that's fine with me. I, I yeah. And then I, I've got and I, and I and, and we would make way. sure in that meeting that finance is here, so they can answer the financial side of the questions. Eileen, they're asking. The spring breaks in March. I mean, it's not in April. It, it's spring break for Boulder City is in April. Okay, well. Not, not for his college, but it is for college high school. I don't think our, 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 I don't think our advice to the council should be dictated by when spring break is. It should be dictated by the resolution. Now, we can vote on it. It's a democracy. If people don't want to do it my way, it's okay. But I, I feel we should abide by the resolution. That's the document that dictates what we should be doing. So we should do our best, you know, to, to fulfill our obligation under the resolution. That's my opinion. If I'm voted down, it's okay. You know, we're a democracy. And, and, I can't force other people to do what I want to do just because I'm a strong personality. That's and, not reasonable. And, and George, I guess my opinion is they, they, they need both. 
even though it doesn't say they need FY21, I think we as staff, and even though that's not written exactly, I think the council would anticipate annually that you guys would review each fiscal year. But it's in, one is included in the other. If we do the five-year plan, it includes FY21. So it's not, I'm not Understand. saying don't do FY21. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm just saying do what it says. Okay. I don't have a sort of logical mind, which sometimes doesn't work in the real world. But anyway, so yep. I'm just saying that includes what you want. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I think having, we'll discuss the capital plan and the rate study on Monday. Mm -hmm. And then we will discuss, um, well, actually now we're talking about the, uh, well, we're talking about time scales, what projects we want to do. We'll go and make sure we have that in the agenda items. Um, but we also want to talk about the five-year plan, which I have no problem with. I'm just trying to make sure we have things we can do with what the data we have in the period we have and what mm -hmm. we can do them in. I just think, I've been available yep. the whole, the, every time I will be available in April except for one week which I'm sure we can work around. Yeah, we can work around. Tonight. So um, let's see what we can get done in the next two weeks or the next two meetings on next Monday and the first. And then if we can, we get to the agenda item. Let's look at seeing about another meeting in April to see when we're here and to see the best data we can. Then the next step, we can see what the council did um, ask for, and then we can go through the tasks and see what we have going. Well, and it does seem like the... Um Mondays are the best days um, outside of our Wednesday, first Wednesday of the month. So we will pick a couple of Mondays in the middle of April and just send that out to see if we can get a quorum. Just for purposes of planning that meeting. Yeah, it's probably safer because we've, when we've seen to do it here, we've seemed to miss the yeah. miss the night. So I yeah. guess it's probably best to to do that. Um, I. Is there anybody that knows, though, um, in April? I've gone the 18th to the 25th. Okay. I'm gone the 5th through the uh, 12th. So if we did it um, the Monday after, I guess. Yeah. What about you, Eileen? Well, it's, I guess that's part of the agenda. I, I, I'm still so, trying to make sure where we're at, but yep, to, yeah, possibly. But mm -hmm. we want about two dates just so to make sure they we'll, can get. We'll send out a couple of Mondays, make sure they don't conflict with anything, and see where we can get the biggest crowd. Okay, I was just trying to get a little yep. bit of a feel yep. to help make it easy for you. But yeah, I guess two or three would be helpful. Okay. So okay, thank you. Again, the, the reason for this is it was suggested. It's not clear to me who is going to write this report, but Larry had suggested to me that I would write it. The reason I keep pushing this is I don't feel I can do an adequate job on that timeline because I, you know, I need help. I need to be able to meet with people and represent the views of the committee, not just write some blather that I pulled out of. My, you know. So that's why I'm pushing for this. If someone else is writing the report and they feel they can do a, a complete job in the time, that's fine. Let someone else do it. I, I'm not pushing to write these reports. I just feel let's do the job we've been assigned to do. And, and so I guess just to make sure, I don't think anybody here, I am definitely not saying that no. we're trying to do something else. What I'm trying to say is I'm trying to do a report with the data we currently have. I'm trying to give the council something they can use now. Then we can do another report that does something. If we can do the five-year report, the five-year report in, with the information we have, I'm happy to do that. But I think the out years, we haven't really talked about it enough. So to say that we agree with everything in the out years is a little hard. The other thing that this report is a difficult thing, I totally agree. The way that these open meeting laws, the best thing I can understand is that whoever writes it then puts it to, sends it to the city. The city then will send it to us, if I understand correctly. We then have to send it back to the city, who will put it on the agenda, and then we can discuss it in and open forum right away. as an e easy thing. So if we start doing some basic bullet ideas by, um, even if, you know, by the first, then we would have something. And then if we can't vote on it, and if we still don't have the data, then maybe we do need another meeting in April. Right, I agree with all of that, surprisingly. So I'm not here to disagree with everything. I, I agree, that's what we need to do. We need to come up with bullet items. That's what I'd like to do today. Because if we don't do it today, I don't know I was, how can we do this. So, and the other thing with the five-year plans, we're supposed to review it annually. So, you know, we were 
formed in May or something at our first meeting in July annually. Now we can start splitting hairs about what that means. But anyway, I agree with the bullet plan. So can we try and do that now? Let's come up with a bullet plan. Sure. Well, let, let's. You've got some inf feedback from the council, so let's uh, see what that is, and let's go from there. And again, I, the open meeting law is kind of, I hate to say it in public, it's kind of a pain. I would rather have shared this with you, with everybody. But again, it was suggested that I might be writing the report. Maybe that won't happen. I don't know. But if it's me, I felt like, let's get some feedback. So the mayor, the, I, got, I wrote to all five council members, basically said, saying, uh, I don't know, go on for hours, but whatever, I had the email. The UIC is getting to work on drafting our report to the city on the five-year capital improvement plan and budget, allegedly. It, it looks like I'll be writing the first drafts. So is there anything specific you would like addressed in that report or anything that would be helpful to you? Feel free to let me know, since I think solicited advice is better than unsolicited advice. So here's what I got back from the mayor. A summary of the actions of the UAC would be helpful for, mem for members of the city council. I, can, I have this in writing if you, you guys want to... Pass it around, and I should, maybe we can get a copy to Dennis and the staff there. But, but anyway, just for the so included in the summary could be the issues that a committee member believes are the near-term actions needed. The interaction with the rate study consultants are obviously significant as the completion of that study comes closer. I believe including any issues the UAC members. He has is a bit of a typo, but I think he, what he means we do not believe where we do not believe we have been provided sufficient information is also important. A brief review of the capital improvement projects that are proposed or needed but not included would be informative. I am interested in a review determining whether reserve funds are sufficient to complete the proposed projects. So, you know, that's kind of a, a lot of stuff that the guy wants and I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have asked, but I think we're reporting to him, that's our job. So that's, now the question is, how do we fit that into bullet format where we, you know, there's an enormous amount of knowledge in this committee and experience and where people can provide what they know, you know, and contribute what they know to this thing so we can come up with a sort of consensus. So that's what, I agree with Larry, I wanted to get this into bullet form so I can at the very least in the next day or two submit a bullet thing to the city and then, you know, People can contribute as they see fit, and we can see how far we've got by April 1st in answering those questions, unless we don't want to answer those questions, which is also an option. Well, again, I, it's not that we don't want to answer the question, it's just a matter of what we, we have. Um, so let's just look at the, like, the first one from the mayors, is I believe a summary of the actions of the USC would be helpful, members of the CAC. So, um, I, I guess the, the question is, 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 um, you gotta pull it forward for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we need to think about that. I guess. Well, have you thought about that as an action, a bullet item? Well, yeah, I think we should put that in there and tell the mayor what we've done. You know, yes, it's very simple. That's the bullet items. Actions of the UAC. What have we done? We've been getting together since July. Let's summarize for them what we've done. Well, the one way you could do it is to pull it off. You could pull off some of the minutes, but and that's one thing we've, uh, but we've never signed off any minutes yet. <laughs> okay, um, we could uh, take the minutes and basically state that we've met. Um, you've got some of that from the first report. We need to take the first report, and um, a suggestion would be the first report would be that has we've done some. Um, if we just take some of the uh, who we've some of the uh, presentations we've listened to, some of the information we've started to get an understanding of, uh, depending on what everybody feels comfortable how to how to state that. I guess that could be done from um, from the minutes. Um, so do we want to, if somebody has some ideas, I think we have some people that are leaving relatively soon on vacation. Um, I'm leaving, well, I'm leaving, uh, yeah, Sunday. Okay, because I was debating whether, so did you want some help, George? Do you have an idea? Do you want some of us to write 
some of the things, or do you have an idea how you want to put it together? Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that item, I, I think, yeah, that's, that one seems pretty straightforward to me. I mean, we just say, hey, we had these presentations on these subjects. I don't think it has to be, you know, war and peace. I think the shorter it is, the more likely it is to be read. So, but we can say, here's what we did. Here's here, just a summary. Yeah, I, that I can do. That part I can do because that's sort of bureaucracy just going through the agendas and just summarizing for them. Near action, near term actions needed, that I don't feel I can do on my own. I can put a bullet there and maybe get help from the committee members and say, what do you as individuals think needs to be done? In the near term, I don't know what that means, maybe the next six months. If you guys, if the committee wants input from staff, just let us know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can throw in our two cents as well. Yeah, well, I guess theoretically, it's not our report, but whatever two cents you need from yeah. us, we can we can do that. One of the things is we need to look at the res. You, you sounds like you memorized the resolution. Sorry, well, <laughs> but it's um, very long. <laughs> is that we need to figure out what the resolution is asking for us, and that we, those are the things that we need to be doing. I guess in the near future is so what we haven't what we haven't got to in the resolution then we, I, I'd assume we'd probably want to try to get ideas related to that so you're going to pull it up now <laughs> you sound not too happy I don't have to if you no, I, no, I'm except, not trying to torture you guys <laughs> <laughs> go ahead you're because that'd be it because I think there was five things on there I, that one I haven't memorized um I haven't gotten back to it yet um you got it okay Eileen. Well, let someone else talk for a change. Purpose, act as an official advisory body on utility capital improvement program planning and utility rates. B, annually review the five-year utility capital improvement plan. C, review the revenue requirements of the utility and recommend to the city council city manager rate adjustments. D, review utility resource plans. E, review uh, utility conservation plans and programs. Okay. And we've actually, we've sort of stalled on those issues, tried to get a better handle on some of the other things. But I guess one thing that we could say in the near, near term is the conservation plans and resource plans. So we need to look at um, or get more information on those. Yes, and we had discussed, um, and I think, you know, we really need, once I, once I think we get through um, some of these more immediate items, then we can start honing on on those resource plans, updating the integrated resource plan for electrical, um, starting to talk about water conservation planning and what that means to, you know, Boulder City versus just what the SNWA conservation plan is. Um, as we stated many times, it, our water conservation program is passive. It's not necessarily aggressive or anything like that. But and then you know the turf removal and what do we do with parks and all those things. That's sounds simple, but for this community, it, it would it's change, and we would have to work through what that would look like. And of course, there are certain things that we're already focusing on as we as it relates to the golf course redesign um there would be water conservation built into that design of that irrigation system so it's not like the city's not doing anything but um it really it's it's kind of a policy issue on potential turf removal programs and stuff like that well that's so i think what we've done and um the cities we appreciate your advice and you're setting it up what we've so I think we stated in the other report, what we've done is we've tried to get an understanding of the main utilities. Um, right. We've sort of put the uh, landfill off, um, just trying to get, because it's not a big project item at this point. Um, but you've gone, and I think we now we have, we've, we have some information on, on all the projects, among all the different utilities now. We've, we've gone through the different meetings and we've, we've gone there. Um, 
so, but then we started trying to focus on the capital because the capital, as we've said, is a big portion. Right. So the big thing that we had in the resolution is the rate. Well, the rate, we're working with the consultants, we have to wait for the consultants, and we have to get a better understanding of the capital to figure right. out what's going on. So that's sort of what we've done, as well as some of these other reports that right. you've brought forward, which we appreciate, um, to go there. So it's nothing that the conservation programs and the resource are things that you guys are not asking the council to do right away either, uh, if I understand correctly. So no, it we wasn't a major rush. Uh, rush at this time, nope. so that's where we are at. So it's not a matter of, so that's one thing we could, we could focus on um, going forward, but still it's not something that has to be done in a month or two. No, process. but it, it I mean, I think it, it's the, I think the last time the integrated resource plan was updated on the electrical side was 2018. So it's, you know, we should probably do it sometime years. this calendar year. It says every five years. Um, um, but I think it would be good, you know, as we've, and I don't want to delve into too many details, but as you know, we've signed the letter of intent to look at the solar with SNWA. So maybe once we get past some of that, that would be a good time to update that plan, knowing that we've uh, kind of modified our resource plan to where we have not only the hydro renewable, but we potentially would have the solar renewable to put into that plan. And I think that that leads to sort of that part of it leads to, I guess, an understanding between the city, the council and ourselves is what we can help with is what goes in front of the council. Right. So if we've got something that we can discuss in a meeting, meeting a ahead of time before it goes to the council, then I think that would be advantageous. And that issue right there would be something I'd bring to this committee. So when we get to a point where we have a draft PPA with SNWA, I, I would bring that to this committee. Right. For a couple of different reasons. One, it's a change in, you know, our, our resource. Um, and two, just so all of us can understand how it relates to the hydropower and the scheduling and just a better understanding of that just how it fits into that portfolio. But I guess so, I don't know if it, so things needed for actions, maybe we would ask them, the council, is, is how much do they want us to interact with things that come before them. The city is is doing. So um, you've got, so again, the so, thing that we're trying to avoid is not getting to your business, but trying to be yeah, helpful. It, and I appreciate that. And you know, and to, to complicate this a little more, and I don't want to get into Monday. Uh, Monday, you're going to see the cost of service. It's kind of hot off the press. Um, the cost of service analysis, and you know, there's some items and issues in there that um, we'll have. You know, the committee will have to debate amongst themselves. And I, I, I would guess that they could potentially, certainly, will lead to potential rate design modifications. Um, if we want to change to make things more equitable. And so stay, that's a stay tuned till Monday, but it, it could be something that we need to either jointly do a workshop with the city council to help, you know, get their input as well, uh, because I think it's gonna get, that stuff's gonna get a little harder if, if that's the right way of putting it. Well, it could, the question is, is how fast a turnaround time do we need on some of these things? Yeah. I think I think we're all willing to try to put the time in, it's just knowing if, do we have to put it in the next couple of weeks or do we have a couple of months? No, uh, this no, one, I, this yeah, one, I yeah, no, yeah, I'm saying generally, yeah, you have a little bit of time. But things, you know, things, it, as long as you tell us what is needed from us, because that yeah. type of thing, I don't think would need be for, for several months. But no, we, you wouldn't. We need to start looking at it. You should start looking at it, but it, again, it, it just in, it affects the completion of the rate study because you almost have to have that decision made before you can get into rate design. So let's, and I'll just an example, and if it appears that there's some inequity in, uh, between whether it's electrical or whatever, uh, a water between residential and commercial, do you want to try to make that more equitable or do you just want to leave it alone? You know, and then that, that's feedback the consultant needs. They can also give recommendations on how they've done it in the past or sometimes when there's a significant inequity between a certain customer class 
uh, it's very painful to fix, you know, the, the guy that's getting the subsidy doesn't want it fixed, don't, don't touch it, right? Uh, the one that's getting the subsidy, or, you know, on the higher end is paying more than they should be, would like it fixed sooner rather than later, or do you phase it in, or do you just leave it alone and call it good? So those do turn into policy issues, and, and uh, certainly the consultant could make recommendations. But I'm just I'm giving that as an example, is that could take some time, and that's eventually a decision that needs to be made so you can get into rate design. Even if there's not a revenue uh, increase required or a rate increase required, that does it, that could impact uh, the time it takes to get the rate design modified. Now, we, are we looking at um, June that they're going to try to finalize? Because I, I think I'm not I'm confused. I believe it was June, time. but again, that, that's where that schedule impact could happen when it starts to get to more of the difficult decisions. Yeah, because I guess that's the yeah. question. So I think what we again, need to understand. And, and I'll we're say still... what I and what I told council is it's more important to take the time to get it right than it is to meet that schedule. So. Yeah, we're not we're not needing to decide if we because we're we're I think we're pretty much all positive there's not a rate needed for July first. There's not a rate increase required. So the only thing I would see happening in the next you know towards the end of the year is if if they're going to modify a rate structure, um, that would just take some time. Right, and so that's that's the thing. I guess I agree totally. We want to get the right information, do the right time. We don't want to rush anything. I just need to make sure that we get some information. That's yep. the reason I was pushing for April 1st, to get the best information, or the information we have right. to us right now. Yep. And I and that's the only reason I was pushing for February 1st, was trying to do that. Because yep. otherwise, we want to get the best information and work forward yep. and, and find out, yes, if we say, OK, they've turned in the draft report and we need to get some additional information and and we're going to do wait till august or something because we do have some things with cost of service etc because that's what it does sound like when we're still we discussed the 37 dollars and we still have and we need to circle back around right. to that and so those are things so we need to but we I, we also need help yep. so you need to let us know we need to figure out and on the agenda and but this item here that we're currently talking on is the scales so I think I think looking forward is that we do we're at a point now where we stop doing too much of the overall utility aspect and we start working focus. on the focus on the capital and, and, and focus on specific items to get what we need so we need we need to understand when do you need the feedback from right. Well, right and i think we can have some of that discussion monday night with the with the rate consultant as it relates to the study okay yep so now i'd say let's just put a bullet point you know when he asked about interaction with rate study consultants i'm just trying to come up with these bullet points since that's what we, let's just say rate study consultants and then people can write in you know what they want and we can try and make it in, right does that make sense acceptable as a bullet right rate well, study consultant you know, discussion. The, the three some if you want to just put three bullets below that, you've received a draft financial plan, or you've at least seen the presentation on the draft financial plan. Uh, from the rates you saw the original um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Monday you'll see the, the the draft cost of service and then so there's a couple bullets right there as it relates right. to the consultant. Um, yeah, we've had this We've had three meetings. We had the original meeting. Right. We've had, we had the, the second. kind of the introductory the meeting. Third one? Well, the introductory meeting, the okay intro meeting, yeah. the draft financial plan, and then the um, cost of service next Monday night. Yeah. So that's, okay, we're getting that. That's three. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. When we had three. So, and then he asks, any area where we would like more information. So let's just have that as a bullet where. You know, members of the committee feel well. We'd like more information. That makes sense. Well, yeah, part of the what I'm known is that we don't. What do we need to investigate? <clears throat> sure. Well, that can go on. That can go under that. Correct. Yeah. But it should be. We should recognize that he's asking, "What have we not uncovered?" Is kind of what I'm taking from his from his statement. Yeah, something like yeah. I mean, you have. How the, do we How do we investigate yeah. that? And the last thing he wants is a review of the capital improvement project. So that I think we can have bullets for each one, you know, each one of the main areas, and then people can, whoever 
you, you guys are all experts. I mean, I feel, I'm not telling you what, the people who are like with experience can fill in the slots as they see fit and hope, <laughs> hopefully we can make that happen. Right. So I would put a slot for review of capital improvement projects, just put a slot for electrical, you know, water, etc. And then now at least we have the framework of a report and we can start, we can get to work. And then the last question was the reserve funds. Yep. Which is a Larry specialty. I don't even understand that question. I thought it was like $2 million in the reserve funds. So I'm not sure what he's talking about there. I, I think really what he's, I, I, we, we and I, uh, different people use reserve fund differently, but really what you're talking, I think really what he's asking there is, is there sufficient fund balance to complete the projects? Yes, because the so. that's that's the way I took it. Because once you put the word project, yeah. in, because the reserves don't aren't associated with projects. With projects. The reserves that we have, restricted reserves, are for rate res, rate um, rate stabilization, stabilization, operational the 20%. operational portion, and then the, the emergency the emergency. So, um, so the thing that so we might really want, it's the fund balance separate right. from those. Correct. And so right now, that's the one thing that we're looking at. And we can discuss that Monday, I hope, because I'm hoping that that's what the um, consultant will work with us also. Because right now, I believe the last um, report, the city manager report showed 26. So you had 44 million, I believe, in or at least rounding up or down. Yep. $44 million in the utility fund. There was $18 million in the restricted fund, which is mostly reserves. Uh, well, I believe it's all reserves. All, reserves. It's all, yeah. all the reserves for um, that we just discussed, and then you have um, the available, and the available is about twenty-six million, I right. believe, right now. Is this for the utilities? Yes, yes. The utilities only. So the utilities. That's and that's what the um, the uh, consultant should help us on to make sure we're not missing anything. So what what their draft showed us is that there was enough money currently. Um, that there was no great needed for the next five years. I think in that five-year capital plan, I thought it was. It was, you're right, and the only the only caveat I think we threw out there is we didn't have the results of what we saw tonight. Right, so. right, and he did have that caveat there. Yeah. Uh, we also don't have to look to, hopefully they've, so if they haven't, I would, if you could ask them to re-look at the, um, uh, the water budget, because I think they used the water budget of 2019 of 11 million and carried that forward, and I don't believe that's what we're going to have. So that would be that would that could hurt what reserves we have or we need. Yeah, we there. I don't know if they'll have it ready for Monday. They they are certainly looking at that. We're also seeing if there's any potential. Um, and this is a catch twenty two kind of thing. If there's sufficient or excess revenue to help paying towards some debt. Uh, of the raw water line, what would those impacts be? I, I don't know that they'll have that Monday night, but that is one thing we've asked them to look at. Okay. Just okay. try to see what happens if you pay that debt off earlier. So right now we can say the revenue fun functions, so that one we, currently we have at least enough, I think you you just stated it tonight, what, two or three years? So At least, yeah. At least. Yeah. So we, that that's looking good. And we'll have, we can have them pull that up again Monday night to take a quick look at. See, I didn't get a chance to look. So we had uh, Claud Claudia yeah, was the yeah. only other one. Was there anything on that one? To... I had, so yeah, I emailed all five of them, and these are the only two that answered. So Claudia had a question about the SNWA, $25 million to get iFluent back to Lake Mead. I, I don't quite see, that's not really in the CIP, or I don't quite see how that, what we're supposed to do with that question. That is not a CIP for us. It, it's it's a project that's being contemplated. Actually, I, I think the entire, so let me back up for a second. The Integrated Resource Planning Advisory Committee for the Senate of the Nevada Water Authority has been meeting to basically debate or agree, or same thing you guys are doing, frankly, with the capital plan, uh, which is about a $3.2 billion program. Um, a project that's included in that is a $26 million project to pump the effluent from uh, Boulder City up into Henderson. Henderson would treat the remaining amount and uh, get the return flow credit. 
Are we look? Is that being pushed as a? Is somebody asking to? Or we really want that to be involved? I thought that was a like a year further out. It, 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 the timing. I, I think the issue is just whether it goes on the plan or not. And is Boulder City okay with it going on to the MCCP? That's I think the issue. So because right now that's one of the thing I think we don't have enough information. Yeah. To, to put any advice on that one, I don't believe. Well, and really, it's being. I agree. It's being. Um, it's being, it's the ERPAC committee that's evaluating that, those projects as SNWA projects. At the end of the day, they would have to come to Boulder City for approval. Um, I was thinking maybe we can put that in the report and maybe you can help us out with that because I fully admit I know zero about that. I can certainly do that. and um, So we can tell her, look, here's our best answer. And that's not. You know, it's, it's. What you know, it's it's an option of removing the effluent from dumping it in the desert. So, and, and even if it gets into the SNWA, there, there are numerous projects, as you guys know, there are projects that go into capital plans that never get built. Um, and just because it goes in a capital plan doesn't mean it would ever get built. And from Boulder City's perspective, at least from my perspective, there's you know, Boulder City has to provide the the property or they have to get the property from us they have to get the easement for the pipeline from us they have numerous approvals they would have to get from us but uh, i guess the question is is it something boulder city wants to consider That's well maybe we can put something in there that just sort of a yeah we can, summarizes I, I what can, you said i can or I, can, or I can do that we can show you you know it's basically it's a pump station located down at the treatment plant that would you know a high head pump station that would pump up to henderson sewer and yeah, sure. So let's just, yeah. I'll leave, yeah, a, we can I'll leave a blank spot there. Maybe you can you put can my name in there. Yeah. Okay. I might scribble people's names as hints. That doesn't mean they have to do anything. Yep. We can and, do that. Uh, but that water, water may be something that the city want to use for agriculture purposes or something like that. It may be a revenue source at some point down the line. If that's, so that could be entered into that decision, with it, what they want to do with it, too. So that wastewater. I thought something, I, I, I'm not going to say it because I'm sure we're not supposed to grow that stuff in Boulder City, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it certainly doesn't preclude, the, if we put that project in the MCCP for SNW, it doesn't preclude us doing something else with the water if, some, if a better opportunity comes up. Well, if they build it, if they spend, because I, I think that's the one thing we could almost say, I think we have said earlier that for Boulder City just to pay any, port, any major portion of that $25 million, I don't see that we would get that back out I don't, so no I, and we've I don't we've it. made we've, i've made it you know pretty clear to snwa that if it's going to cost us more than we're not interested right and but if if they back build it then i don't know if we can back out of it because if they build it no no well, yeah, there would be a joint agreement of some sort because it'd be a, actually it'd be a three-way because it'd be snwa henderson and us yeah and i don't frankly i think it's at the level of um that they're looking at for the major construction program, they haven't even gotten to those kind of details. But it, you know, off the top, $25 million, and for what Boulder City would be, SSNA might be able to do something, but I don't see how that, Boulder City, could you could justify anything like that. So even if we don't spend it, it, it doesn't seem like something that would be just all that justifiable. But at the top, looks. that's one thing I guess we would have to do, do research on the, on the, on later on. The second one about is seems like it's talking about the raw line and that dealing with the thirty-seven dollars. I think is what she's trying to to deal with, and I'm not sure that the thirty-seven dollars that's part of the raw line, but that doesn't pay for all the raw line, does it? So at thirty-seven thousand thirty-seven dollars, that is part um, of the water bill. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll certainly get to that through the rate study um, because. One, um, I can tell you we're meeting with SNWA relatively soon to make sure we totally understand what their charge is. Okay. Um, when this was implemented back in 2016, it was a uh, it was implemented as just a monthly invoice that had some bases based on number of meters at the time and, and the, the cost for um, our proportionate share of the phase two infrastructure and then our cost of intake three or or the, or the new intake three lift station 
because we already we paid off our portion of the tunnel or the intake itself. And so we staff staff and the rate consultant need to understand that. So we're meeting with SMWA shortly to to figure that out. Then we can start talking about what that once we take the SMWA portion out, do we have the appropriate basic service charge for Boulder City? What do we want to look at? That'll be something that this committee will be involved in. Um, do we want to include a, a portion of the commodity in the basic service charge or not? Those kind of things. Yeah, I think the thing in the future to figure out how we can implement it is looks there's at least three things that are confusing. The debt, because um, we refinanced the debt for the wall water mm. line, so just to make sure that we understand how that is all being played out now. Because there, there was also, I think that's what you were saying, that they were going to possibly state is there was some leftover money from the bond. Um, they, can, they can certainly do that one-time uh, payment towards it, and I don't, I'll have, to, I'll have to get that number from Diane. I think it's around $2 million that was, that could go. And then the question is if we applied an annual amount to pay it off sooner, what does that look like? The And that's a balancing act between the capital versus paying that debt off sooner. Exactly. And, uh, and it may be that we can do both. Okay. Based on right. what we saw here with the water, it's possible. I, I, we'll have to see once so, we get those costs together. If we could understand that more, but the other two things that I was still highly confused on is the, now we have the amortization and the depreciation. Yes, so and I'll have finance here in April for you guys to have that discussion because I'm not even going to try. Yeah, right now I understand. <laughs> like, but those are things I think in the future. And again, I can tell you from a rate study perspective, it doesn't matter. They don't include that in as... Well, the debt is, but the other the two... The debt is, but the depreciation is not. So, But that's still a problem for us as far as even the budget. Because if we're saying that the, you're going to have less money at the end, how to, it, it, again, it, the, you can't get two documents to match. So now right. you're going to have a rate study that says you have one need of money. You're going to have right. something that goes to, to the state that says this is the amount of revenue and this is how much you're going to have right. left over. And in some cases, you're going to have a deficit because you have this depreciation. So until we, it, so yes, we, 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 it's, it's another subject. I apologize. Yeah, it's okay. But um, it's one thing we, it still helps. We need to get a better understanding so we can yeah. figure out what we have, if we have to put into another report. Um, what, so I guess in, in, in this you, case, if the, the, we the, can, I guess, are we talking about future agenda items? I forgot which item we're on. We, no, we're still on, unfortunately, we're still oh, on five. Okay. But we can certainly um, add the depreciation and amortization as a as an item. I think we want to do that before the rate study is finalized because the yep. rate study most likely won't have it, but I still think it has budgetary issues. Mm -hmm. It can, so I just want okay. to make sure I understand it. Um, okay, so if so, in t to work with five um, April, we are concentrating on capital and what else do we need to concentrate? So George, what do we need to get to help with your report? What do you want to try to concentrate on? Here's what I'd like to do is make, make these, put this thing into bullet points and I can get this document out in the next day or two. And then are we allowed to rediscuss it on, on Monday or is that off limits? If we put it into the, can you get it, if he sends it by tomorrow? I'll just do it first thing in the morning. Or can we hand it out just like you've handed? We've handed a few documents out. Yeah, but that's such a different item. Um, gotcha. Uh, I mean, it's a discussion. There's no action. Yeah, I don't know. There's no action. Then I think we're okay. So it would be just like you, you got everyone has a chance to review and can maybe get feedback as to where they feel they can contribute in this thing so we can divide up the labor. Does that kind of make sense? Well, actually, Kent, um, you send it to the city. The city sends it to us, and we just don't discuss it between ourselves. So it's, we can all see it, but we can't. We have to bring it back to the, to the So if you send it to them, they send it to us. And then if you guys can look at it before you go on a vacation, that would be... Would it be great? Um, yeah. You're looking leaving. Well, but you're leaving Sunday. Sunday you're leaving night. Saturday. <laughs> so, um, well, it, yeah. If you have time, if not, I understand. Um, we'll see what we can do. But then, and then we would be able to discuss it. On that was sort of the thought. On the so then we could get 
the documents that we supply the city then goes on the April 1st packet and then we can discuss it and say we want to clean this up. Does that make sense? Am I saying it right? Yeah, I mean, obviously we've never done this before, so it's like, if, if, we, if we feel we can do that, my worry was that everyone might think everyone else is doing something and nothing gets done and then we're hosed. So that's my point. Well, if you get the basic bullets out and yeah. you want to put names down and ask for suggestions, we can do that, then, then we can, I guess, okay. we, can, we can also ask the city to please ask George to elaborate <laughs> on something, or do we, do we do that? Uh, yes. Okay. So, yeah. Right, so we'll, we'll funnel it through you, though, and then you'll funnel it with George. I think it's safer bet at this time. So I can put, like, it. question marks, say maybe Larry question mark by an item, and then, you know, people I think, but it's just wild guesses on who thinks they might contribute, and then they can say no or whatever, and we can... I'm just, like I said, I'm worried everyone else thinks someone else is going to do everything, and then we're stuck. That's what the problem I'm trying to fix now. You have a question? Getting, getting into uh, I don't know. <laughs> What's that? If you get individual feedback from any individual member, that's not... You mean I can email them or what? Well, they can send you, either send us to us or we can send it to you, but it, you just can't deliberate yeah, let, uh, uh, on any for, item. For the safer so thing, let's just... Send it to us, send, we'll send, send, it send it out. Send it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's the yeah, easiest thing to I, do. I, I, I hate that way, but I think it's... No, it's uh, fine. I, think it's, no, I don't want to break any laws, but the point is how do we... How do we decide who's going to do what? I'm sorry it's so painful. How, what's the mechanism for doing that? I'm not trying to suggest one. How do we do that? Uh, send it to us, and we'll send it out. And then they come back with feedback to us, and then you guys yeah. can see a product. Staff will just help draft it. Right, but my worry is what if no one does anything? Then we're stuck. That's my then point. Then you have to do it all. <laughs> No, 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 but we have no, I, I don't think that, I don't think that's going to happen. So staff will help with that, with yeah. emailing. He'll get it. He'll get get in feed, we'll ask for feedback from each member and All right. manage, we'll manage the feedback. Everyone seems confident, so I'll... Uh, yeah. if, if you get that first draft done, get to us, we'll send it out. We'll ask yeah. for feedback that eventually... Okay, we'll, I'll get the bullet points at least for sure in the next day or two, and then hopefully we can get things okay. moving. And I think that'll be fine. I mean, we've never done this before, so I right. guess we get a one shot at saying, sorry, guys, we didn't. But this is why I was pushing so early on for agenda, you know, agendizing the whole thing, because I was like, right. how are we going to do this? You know. Right. Anyway, thank you. Okay, so just so we can close out five, is there anything that anybody that we need in a in um, the future, I guess, for even May to set you up. So for, for and let's talk about April if, real quick, just okay. if you don't mind. I know, we're gonna, I know we're gonna focus on the capital plan and I think that's absolutely appropriate and what we should do to try to eventually come to some conclusion on that. Um, but that we will have finance at that meeting. So if you do wanna include a discussion on the depreciation and amortization, I think that might be. I don't think it would take that long. I say that, <laughs> but when we have we have them there, so uh, it might be a good item to have it there as well. I, I really don't think it should take more than thirty minutes. Well, I guess it would be nice is then to, um, and if there's any way we can get the uh, assets, because that's really what the depression's related to is the assets. Yeah. So if, for future things to get a better understanding of the assets, because otherwise right now we're just agreeing to disagree. <laughs> In the meetings we've been at, um, it, the, we've been agreeing to disagree on the def, on the. De um, we're gonna make sure I understand. Oh, are you talking about with finance? With finance. Okay. Yeah. So, but if we bring in the assets, then maybe if they can bring in the assets a little bit, then maybe we can get something that works a little bit better. Okay. So, okay. Um, so that yeah, I guess that would just be. So we're doing the report, so we definitely, I guess if we do the action, if we have, okay, we'll go, I'll go to seven, we'll, do, we'll go over that. So um, for five, we're doing the two or three major things, is that? So you two, the capital and any the possible depreciation. Yep. And, and the amortization would be good because I, I still, that's one thing I have not understood properly. Okay. Yeah, I think and, we can do that. that and then, but I, and then try to keep it just limited to those two. 
Okay, for April. Then, and then we, then so then when we get down to the re, to the to the action, then we're just gonna we'll bring back the report. Mm -hmm. We for just April. on on seven. We'll talk about the future items, and then um, is there anything you need lead time for May, or we just do that in April? Mm, I think we can just do that in April. Um, okay, Sounds I think by once we get through the capital. Um, I, what I see is focusing on the rate study after that. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and then you've got a five minute presentation, George, as a follow up from last time. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say a couple of words and I'll try and keep it to three minutes. I'm watching the clock. I mean, I've talked too much at this meeting, but I just want to say I, the the chair Larry conveyed to me, you know, informally that it was sort of inappropriate the way I was questioning, you know, SNWA and maybe somewhat irrelevant as well. And I wanted to try and explain what I was trying to do since it wasn't clear. So my perception is SNWA came in here and said they'd run climate models and they said the river flows were going to increase in future years. That's what she said. She said 12.4 and they ex expect it to go up. And my point was that is at odds with all of the climate models. You can't I find a hydrologist or anybody who thinks that the river flows are going to increase in the future. That doesn't mean they're right. The experts may be wrong. But my point is if SNWA is going to walk in here and say that they disagree with all of the expertise of scientists on this issue and they think it's going to go the other way, they should be prepared to defend their opinion. And even though my question was maybe a bit questioning was a bit harsh or pushing it. I thought they were pushing it coming in here and saying, and I felt I was on the agenda. I mean, I'd read the report. It was the SNWA Water Resource Plan. And so, but then again, I'm just saying that. I'm just a guy saying, well, I think hydrologists disagree. So I wanted this paper included in our packet to say, here is a paper written in the journal Science by USGS scientists that said why they explain the river flows to decrease and why the decrease had been underestimated in the past. And you might say this is esoteric science that has no place in a city council to be discussed or whatever, but it was written up in the regional media in the southwestern US, it was written up in the national media in the United States, and it was written up internationally. So it wasn't like some obscure paper by someone in a dusty office. And so, I think it was appropriate to question them when they're saying things that are the opposite of what the credentialed scientists are saying. Then the idea was it was irrelevant because Larry said to me, if the river flows go to zero, it has no effect on Boulder City and Southern Nevada. And I just respectfully disagree with that. That's all. I don't want to start a big debate or provoke people, okay. but I just disagree. That's all. Okay, George, part of, part of the things that we're getting at is just your last comment. Um, you, you're, ten, you're making these black and white statements that, frankly, make, the, make me look like, and some other people look like idiots. Um, so we're not saying, you're, you're taking what we're saying and you're putting it into your words. And so it's very difficult for us, we're not, and to get presenters back, you, there's a thing to discuss, analyze, and work on. It's another thing to attack a um, presenter. So that's the thing, I think we all want to be, we want to be polite, we, we want to work with things, so we just need to figure out, we're still trying to get our, we don't, this whole committee is trying to figure out what we're doing. Um, but we don't want to attack each other. We don't want to attack that. And by stating that, uh, there's several things I've said that you've twisted, and I think that's what you were doing in that case. Is what we were trying to do is several of us were trying to say, let's just be polite. And so in this case, what I was understanding was the, what we were really discussing was what was Boulder City getting? What was the amount of, of water? So that's what I was trying to state. And in the relationship to the amount of water we were getting, certain things were in balance. So you have a point to review and you can keep that in mind. I don't disagree, but we have to be careful on how we relate to each other. We're coming to a point where actually we're attacking each other and we don't want to do that. And that's what at least I feel like. So that's the thing that I at least want to be careful of is in that respect.
Okay, well, let me finish what I'm... My idea was I'll say my piece and then you can say whatever you want. I, I, that's the way I would like to do it. This is my point is I didn't like being censored like I just was then. Let me finish my piece. I said I'd take three minutes and then you say whatever you want. I won't interrupt you, I promise you. And you can say that everything I said was wrong. I have no problem with that. But the point is I didn't feel it was inappropriate to harshly criticize SNWA when what they're saying is at odds with what the experts are saying. And I don't think it's irrelevant because the river supply is in fact a key element of our water resource. So I just wanted to make that point. And I was silenced, I was told to shut up and I did because I think we have to respect the chair. So you say, I'm attacking you, I'm respecting you. I also felt I was respecting SNWA by reading their report. I was the only person, I think, who actually read the report and read the reports on which it was based and actually analyzed some of the data. So it wasn't like, I've never met Mrs. Pellegrino, I don't have it in for her, I have no personal animosity to anyone. But I think it's important that when we do policy, it be based on sound science. I think that's an important principle. And if we disagree on that, I would point to Exhibit A, which is the coronavirus situation, where exactly what happened last month happened in China, where the scientists said, this is a very dangerous situation and we need to address it. And the uh, policymakers said what you said to me, it's inappropriate to criticize these people to criticize an attack, and in any case, it's irrelevant. Now we have 3,000 dead people, we have 100,000 infected people, probably the number comparable to the population of Boulder City is gonna die, precisely because the scientists were told to be quiet, because it was inappropriate to question policymakers. I think that's a mistake, it's a free speech issue. I know this isn't a place for lectures, and I said I keep it to less than five minutes. I've said my piece, Please feel free to say whatever you want and criticize me as much as you like. I don't, I'm not inviting criticism, but you have every right to criticize me. And I, I won't interrupt you, I promise you. I guess in this case, the one thing I want to get, first off, the old adage that we don't want to shoot the messenger. So I believe the presenter was as much of a messenger as it was. If you were in a room with scientists and you were debating the issue with that, then you have the full right to ask all the questions and to debate the science. We weren't in a meeting to debate the science. That, that's the way I was understanding it. And so there you, it, just, it seemed to get into a point where it was more of an attack than it was the other thing. So to, and to, to base it, to compare it to the to the virus isn't quite fair because we weren't, I wasn't saying you can't ask your questions and that you're challenging the, um, the, the uh, authorities. It was just a matter of that it wasn't the right time. We weren't, getting, we weren't in a position to change policy at that point. We weren't making a decision on policy. It wasn't even a discussion. It wasn't even on the agenda for a possible action. This was a presentation. So in your case, you were saying that how do we do how do we do policy if we don't have good science? Well, we weren't doing policy. So it was a matter of there, that's where I think it was more impolite because, so if you felt that we were doing policy and you felt that the data was completely wrong and you couldn't go forward with it, I can agree with that. And to, and to point out that, hey, I can't, I can't give a good answer if I can't do the thing, but that's what we weren't doing. So I think all of us, me included, if need to be, so we need to sort of censor ourselves. To, we need to be polite, we need to work it out in all our data. So just be careful what we're doing and understand what the agenda item is, who the person is presenting it, and what our role is into it. So there are certain things that we can ask, there's other things that we just need to be careful. And it wasn't, I think a few people thought it was getting out of hand, so at that point, it's just best to sort of let's, let's calm the situation down and come back later. But that's things we want to figure out how we go forward with it. Thanks. I, all I know is that this climate change is a very contentious issue all across the United States. There's two very stubborn sides, I guess, to the thing, probably more than that. And... Uh, there are a lot of very competent sciences on both sides of the issue, so I hesitate to try and jump in the middle of SNWA's playpen on this thing and, and try to tell them what they need to be doing differently. The, the thing that's somewhat comforting to me is, is that lakes are still awfully big, and the waters are still flowing, the storms are still coming, and sometimes more so than other years, the lake is higher than it's been in, in some years in the past. 
and also um, we have banked a lot of water. SNWA has banked several years worth of water between California and Arizona that uh, we can pull back out of the lake before they can take it. And so it's, I think there's, there may be problems. I'm not saying there's not, but it might be a lot of years before we actually do see those problems come to fruition. And uh, we, one of those things, we may just have to let time determine it because we're really not in a position to do much about it. So. Does anybody else want to add anything? Or I don't know. So I think we've all had our say. So if, if you want me to conclude this, I, would, uh, I can uh, maybe a little funner side of it is uh, I'll be uh, in Albuquerque in a, a week from Thursday and uh, attending Dr. Fleck's uh, water resource class and providing some answering questions and, you know, for students who are in that program. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to get in. I'm not the scientist that's going to talk about climate change, but I think it will be good for them to hear uh, how these kinds of issues uh, impact water resource managers and impact communities and what their future roles are as hopefully future good water resource managers. Hopefully I can help with that. Hopefully it's helpful and not hurtful as, as they consider what their future uh, careers are, whether they're going into the science side or going into the policy side, because that's basically the two programs that Dr. Fleck has uh, in the University of New Mexico. So just FYI. Sounds good to me. I guess <laughs> I'll close the item. If other people want to say something, I'm... No problem. Okay, so let's just close it and then back to you. So the last agenda item before the public comment period is the uh, possible action, the agenda items. Um, so for April, we have the two, is just two items that you had, Dennis? For Okay, that'd be great. So then, um, and, and I might reserve that if, um, if I may. Uh, depending on, on uh, Monday, we could potentially an add a rate study item. I just don't know exactly what it would be yet. So that could be a third that would go in April. Yeah, that, that, because it might be we just sort of put the keep the rate just do a rate study rate update. study update each time as well as the capital. I think those are two things that's we're going we to need we talk from so, yeah. from going on. Yep. Did I understand correctly that we're going to review George's report, report. also on April? Right. So yep. I, I haven't got there yet. We'll do number five. So number five is the, you want a specific agenda item for that? Or just because five says that we will do, um, let's see, so five, for the, we'll say the whole five. Okay. Possible. So this is, we definitely want possible action. Yes. Um, preliminary discussion of timescales for completing tasks assigned to the committee by the resolution and drafting reports to update city council. So do we want anything more specific or is that, um, do you think that's okay? I think we should have something more specific because that is just preliminary discussion of timescales and we're gonna be actually discussing the report that George is going to. Okay, so just to be on the safe side, let's just. So um, two separate items. Yeah, let's so just, uh, like for item three or something like that, okay. early on is just say, um, for possible action, discussion. Now that allows us to vote? If you say possible action, yes. Okay, so discuss and pos discuss, what do we want to say, discuss of the draft report to the city council? Is that good enough, George, is that? Yeah, that's fine. It's fine. Yeah. yeah, that's okay, I'm going silent now. <laughs> okay, um, so then, um, Okay, so but let's then go ahead and do uh, what five is and leave that on there, and, and then um, yep, and then seven. So, with, but you know it would be reduced, but that right. but the, for future actions. So we're doing the time scales, the future actions, and then we have three items other right. than that. And we can again we can sit down once before then one more time if we need to if we if something else comes up. Actually, we'll have four. Sorry, because we have the um, update of the rate study. Right. So, okay. Um, am I missing anything? Okay. Um, so I guess that is it for the 
um, regular agenda items. And so now we have the uh, final comment, public comment period. If anybody would like to make any statement. Okay, it looks like everybody's had a full night. <laughs> So no, we will um, move to a. I will move to adjourn. Um, so moved. Second. Right. Okay. Aye. I mean, Aye. Vote, right. um, any nays? And mm -hmm. so we will adjourn for the night then. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody.